and also JetBrains. Um, uh, they sponsor us by allowing us to give away one of their products, which you can win if you tweet on the hashtag uh, .NET Knots during the evening. Then uh, we will, at some point over the next couple of days, draw out somebody um, from that list of tweets, and you will win one of uh, JetBrains' many products, including ReSharper and PHP Storm and WebStorm and uh, Rider and things like that. They do many different developer tools for developers. So uh, you'll have your pick for a 12 month license. Uh, very good. Uh, so tonight we have Ian Johnson talking about complex systems and Lee Engelson talking about augmented reality, Xamarin, C Sharp, and .NET. Uh, so two fab talks will begin in the order you can see them on the screen. So that worked out quite nice um, with Ian. What we tend to do is we kick off around seven o'clock and we have an hour's worth of speaking and then we do some questions uh, and then uh, we have a couple of minutes break for you to use the loo and then we have our second talk and then more questions and then an open discussion at the end that we just leave going until everyone leaves. Uh, so that's how that's going to work. Uh, we'll tend to mute everybody uh, during the, the talks just to keep it um, simple and clean and then we'll unmute everybody which is even more difficult these days since Zoom made their changed the UX uh, so I can mute you all but if you want to speak then just unmute yourselves um, I don't have control over that anymore so um, yeah speaking to the screen while you're muted is not funny as about four-fifths of the people here can attest to as they tried to do exactly that when they came in uh, coming up next month, we've got uh, John Craddock with the longest talk title I've ever seen, uh, but basically OpenID um, Connect and Azure AD uh, endpoints, and the fabulous Mark Rendell as well, talking about code that writes code. So uh, that's going to be a good evening. Um, next month, on the 16th of July, not so T, have got uh, Derek Woodruff talking about Tesla coils and Eleanor Tang talking about smart pins. So that's going to be two cool talks too. And then tomorrow, if you're interested in DevOps, uh, then they're having lightning talks all around the topic of diversity. So that should be fantastic as well. Obviously, all of these things are all on Zoom, like everything else is. Uh, and that's about it. So I will uh, do the not quite as difficult uh, job of swapping over and letting Ian begin his section. And I'll also mute everybody and remember to unmute uh, I mean, well, at least ask to unmute Ian so that he can actually do some speaking. Oh, oh it's very slow. There we are. So, yeah, you should be able to unmute yourself now, Ian, if you wanted to. Yep. Hopefully cool. you can still hear me. I can. Cool. So, um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about complex systems design in nature. Because I feel that nature has been problem solving a lot of the things that we solve. And it's been doing it for a lot longer than we have. And it's actually come up with a lot of the same solutions and may have some hints and tips about how we could move forward with our own systems. And if I give focus back to the right thing. So a bit about me. I'm Ian Johnson. I've been a developer for about 20 some years now. Um, I occasionally try and do a bit of art. I'm not very good at it, but you know, I try. Um, I do some sketch noting. You might have guessed I like Star Wars. Um, just something about like the background may have suggested it. And occasionally I do a bit of baking. My pronouns are he, him. And you can find me on ijohnson underscore TNF. TNF stands for the Ninja Ferret. <laughs> and the Ninja Ferret came out of a very drunken discussion where Ninja Mongoose sounded ridiculous. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, today, we'll talk a little bit about the fundamentals of biology. Um, some things about emergent design. Um, some stuff around sort of the architecture of biological systems. And then go move into what we can learn from nature and what we could do better and a few final thoughts. So what is going to be in the fundamentals of biology? Well, you really can't talk about it without talking about DNA, but DNA is not going to run without a cell. And we're going to look at how 
we deploy a genome. So I think there's, this is not, hopefully everybody's going to know a lot of this anyway, but hopefully this will just get everybody onto the same page. DNA. This is at the core of everything that we know that lives. Now, there may be, may be something out in space that doesn't rely on um, amino acid structures to produce DNA, but everything that we know on Earth, every living being has some form of DNA. Um, and you've got, basically, it's like our byte code. It's like our binary, but this is base four. So you have four bases that we can work on. Cytosine, guanine, adenosine, and thymidine. And these form a double helix structure by pairing with each other. So cytosine and guanine pair together, and um, adenosine and thy thymidine pair together. Now, you think, okay, so that's quite, so as I say, it's a bit like our binary. Um, and what happens is that we form um, a double helix structure that is we call chromosomes. And chromosomes can be broken down into genes. And effectively, this is very much like what we're doing. We're coding. Genes are kind of like classes or functions that occur in our system, or they're the template at least for that. Um, and what will happen with the gene is that it will be transformed into a protein. And protein is the thing that actually does the work. It's part of the runtime of our system. Proteins can produce things like antibodies, enzymes, or even things like messenger hormones. Um, and, you know, it's quite interesting for people to re do research into DNA at the moment, not just from a biological perspective, but even from a information storage perspective. So in a single gram of um, DNA, we can probably store 200 petabytes of data. So quite an information dense storage medium, if that's what we, um, if we want to explore and investigate how we could potentially use this in future. Um, so what about us? The human cell contains 46 chromosomes, not 23 as people think, 46. You get half, 23 from your mother and 23 from your father. Um, and they kind of come in pairs again so that we can basically see that um, like you will have basically the same functions duplicated in both of them. And so that's roughly about 6 billion base pairs or about 1.5 gigabytes of code. Now that is an executable size of about 1.5 gigabytes. Now, I really hope nobody here has seen an executable size that's that big. I mean, if we think about translating this into source code, that must be hundreds, if not thousands of megabytes of, um, or gigabytes of data that would have to be written to make, um, to represent the human genome. But the genome needs a runtime. And, you know, not going into too much detail here, but the cell is effectively the host for our DNA, the machine that it runs on, the thing that we deploy into it. Um, so most of our DNA exists inside the nucleus. There's a little bit inside the mitochondria, um, but for the most part, um, most of our DNA exists inside the nucleus. And what happens is that with inside the nucleus, the DNA is chemicals run down the double helix structure and they form RNA. And this gets passed out to what is called the endoplasmic reticulum. And inside the endoplasmic reticulum, there are ribosomes which translate the RNA into proteins. 
And from then on, the proteins form the cell walls, the structures, everything that you basically need to live is formed of the proteins. So sort of we've got transcription and transp like transpiling going on effectively in our code. We've got some interpretation going on. This is very much like our machines are doing. So we've got the runtime. It's the um, driving force of this. We even have garbage collection because the lysomes come along after the proteins have finished doing their work, after the RNA has been transcribed, the lysomes come along and break all those unwanted molecules down into smaller particles that can be passed out of the cell membrane. So we have garbage collection. We have processes that are running. We have um, a cell membrane, which to an extent is an API because it allows things like water to pass through. It allows nutrients to pass through. It even allows, it even has receptors that will allow specific chemicals to pass a message through the boundary, but other things are not allowed. So here we have effectively the little computer of nature of which we're all part. So, and how do we deploy a genome? Even with inside us, what we have is a sexual reproduction. Each cell will divide. The double, each gene or each chromosome will be split in half and move, move to the one side of the cell as it divides. And from that, the cell can reproduce um, another version of itself, or the DNA can reproduce another version of itself um, because of the pairing that I talked about er earlier. Um, and so, you know, copy paste anybody? I think most of us have done copy paste development. Well, nature's not upset about doing that either. You know, it's got something that works, copy paste it, keep going. But as I said, um, we, our bodies grow like that, but when we originally are formed by our parents, um, we produce bisexual reproduction where our parents provide a copy of each chromosome to us and our cells start forming out of that combined version. Um, so we've seen basically how um, DNA is very much like binary code that we have very much like, and the cell is the runtime that's a four bit interpreter or four bit runtime that runs our code, that the cells provide an API, that the cells provide um, garbage collection, the cells provide all the things that, this, that is needed to run the DNA. Um, and that we deploy by copy paste. So how do we take this and move forward? Well, we all know that cells eventually mutate. We know that nature goes through um, an iterative design process. Um, but we'll take a look a little bit about what the evolutionary pressures are and whether we should be, and in nature, there is the difference between the generalist versus the specialist. And we'll also take a quick look at how nature has even created its own legacy code. So development by mutation. Um, as I say, we do a lot of copy pasting in nature. And even we do, when we're downloading from one computer to another to deploy our software, what are we doing? We are copying it from one system and pasting it to another. How do we know that what we copied is correct? Well, we have MD5 hashes that we can copy down and compare um, and compare the hash and we can calculate the hash on our own machine and on both machines and go, yep, okay, that's an actual copy of what we want. Nature kind of goes, yeah, who cares? You know, there might be a slight transcription error somewhere. There might be a problem in copy and pasting that code. There might be um, a slip up where 
um, a base pair gets swapped around or even more base pairs get added. But nature kind of goes, yeah, yeah, well, this is how it works. It, if it's not viable, then the cell won't carry on. If it is viable, then the cell will grow and reproduce and produce more of itself. So it's almost like us as a system just deciding to keep copy and pasting our code and hoping that a neutrino hits the ones and zeros at the right time to make um, some differences in our code base to add a feature. But nature doesn't do this once. Nature's doing this billions of times, trillions of times. In fact, we probably can't count how many like cells have created or been destroyed or have created by this process. Um, and so nature does this by just having lots of things do it, lots of things um, mutating. Some cells won't mutate when they're copied, other cells will. Some cells are more prone to mutation, other cells aren't. So what, we're see, what, we're going to, what we see is that this random mutation is probably not what we're hoping to achieve when we're writing software. I mean, it's probably how I write software. I just hit the keyboard until a random mutation compiles, um, but I'm not doing it via copy and paste. And I'm hoping that everybody else is doing it way more efficiently than I am. Um, so if a mutation becomes more successful, what is going to happen is that that mutation will, be, will become reinforced in the population as it gets more, more and more of them share the same code, as it will outcompete the others. And what we have, therefore, is iterative, iterative design. Now, this is effectively me trying to show A-B testing. Because A-B, no, never mind. Um, and it's actually nature's doing multivariate testing. Um, because the success criteria of mutation in nature is how effectively that variant keeps, keeps breeding in subsequent generations. So therefore, like for example, the bees here, the larger bee is going to have more and more trouble getting towards the nectar of the plant. The smaller bee is going to have easier access, but the plant doesn't want to make it so that like bees can get to the nectar without actually collecting the pollen. So they're both evolving at the same time. There's thousands of different, well, and almost an infinite number of variants that nature is trying out at any one given time. And as I say, it's about the each generation that is being produced, about whether that mutation is more successful or not for the next, and will make it more viable in the next generation or more prevalent in the next generation. And to study this, therefore, what has tended to happen is people, scientists have tended to use something with a very short life cycle. So you can actually see genetic mutations happening in things like fruit flies, because they probably produce a generation every 10 days, whereas humans are doing it every 22 years. So to actually see the effects of mutations over a community, um, you want something with a very short life cycle. So the faster the feedback loop, the quicker you're going to see change. I've heard that before in tech somehow. Um, but it doesn't mean we've been very successful as a larger animal with a fairly slow reproduction cycle. So I think it's not just about the fact that we have um, a longer life cycle. It's got to be relative to your product. Like Pete, there's no point going for a really short life cycle if you're not going to see the effect over that time or feedback cycle if you're not going to see the effect over that time. If you're, if you're a fly, then we see that like the, the cycles that the fly needs, because it doesn't have to learn much, it just has to fly, find food, eat food, reproduce. It doesn't need a long life cycle. We need 20 years to learn, to understand about the world around us. We need like several decades of actual growth before we actually become 
viable human beings. Well, I'm not saying that children aren't viable, by the way. I'm just saying that like um, before the actual mutation has actually proven that it's viable, I should say. Um, so it's kind of this, and this leads on to sort of the idea of the evolutionary pressures that we have placed upon us. Like thousands of years ago, um, or millions of years ago, a number of animals were quite happily swimming in the oceans. And as the continents changed, as continents broke apart and moved back together again, certain oceans just kind of gradually, very gradually stopped existing. They became shallow seas. They became um, even like savannas now. And animals that remained as fish, unfortunately, have now just confined to the fossil record. Animals that over time where the mutations were correct, they grew legs, they learned to breathe out of the water, and they moved onto the land and were very successful on the land. So that's kind of a very gradual change. Like we might see it as sort of over several lifetimes how the music industry has changed. It went from kind of vinyl to cassette to CD. And now who buys a CD anymore? Now vinyl's growing back up in um, popularity in some circles, but it's never going to reach that same level again because the slow change of the world has actually meant that you have to adapt to what is around us at the moment. But sometimes evolution can be extremely quick in terms of, especially in terms of geological timeframes. So the dinosaurs saw a huge comet come and smash into the land. Now, probably within, like, in that moment, millions of dinosaurs died. Um, but probably it took several generations for them all to die out. Because what happened was those that weren't initially killed in the initial explosion, their environment was radically different to what it was before. So there probably wasn't enough sunlight reaching the plants to produce enough food to, for the herbivores. So the herbivores, there were fewer of them and they were, um, they were probably smaller. The, therefore the carnivores, again, couldn't sustain, the herbivore population couldn't sustain the carnivores and they die out within several generations on the geological timescale really quickly. Whereas smaller creatures that we, inherit, that we evolved from, things like mice and voles that were very much smaller and could survive in this um, hellscape that this meteor had provided, um, they actually then became the dominant species or moved to become a dominant species in the world. Because they were smaller, they were more adaptable. They were able to survive a sudden um, changing environment. And as I briefly talked about as well, the other pressure that you get on evolution is competition. So as I say, the competition for um, a mate, the competition between predator and a prey. So on the savannas, um, the cheetah learned to run fast. And so the, gale, the gazelle tried to run faster too. But also, what at some point, one of them learned that it wasn't just about running fast, it was about being able to change direction quickly. So that if you could change direction, your enemy zooms off in a different direction and you have time to escape. And there's constant evolution that's happening to change the designs of these two creatures to make it so that um, the more successful creatures are the ones that catch the food more often. And you get competition for food. So what is the food for us? What's the competition for us? Well, it is the competition. We are all competing against other companies for our customers' attention. And their attention normally means their money as well. Um, and sometimes, depending on the company, 
I might say Microsoft occasionally. Um, but internally, there is competition. Does your project get funded? Does it not get funded? Do you give um, sort of link to SQL to the Entity Framework team who go, well, obviously Entity Framework is what we're um, going to focus on more. Um, like these like we constantly have competition that we're trying to make sure that we've got the right resources available at the right times to do the right features, to get the right people. And yet we could still have um, sort of a cataclysmic event for some like sort of um, Microsoft coming into your market, which has happened several times with several people. Like um, the recent example was apt-get, which was a package manager for Windows. And Microsoft had come along and said, we're going to do something very similar and we're going to produce our own one. And then that's a cataclysmic change in the environment as far as apt-get was concerned. Once it becomes, once there's an official Microsoft supported package manager, the ecosystem is going to die for that thing. So we have, so we have sort of the cataclysmic events that happen around us and probably more gentle pressures. If you're looking now at what's happening in the cloud, you might see things like um, cloud computing become, or compute becoming very much like we use water and electricity right now. We can just turn it on and off as you need it. And that massively changes things for like, I work at Redgate. If our tools don't work on Azure, are we going to get left behind by a market that's going more and more towards distributed cloud computing? So all of these things, all of these different evolution pressures are things that we should be at least aware of when building our systems. And should we be, as a tool, should you be the generalist, like the mouse, that sort of thrives just about anywhere in the world? Or may, should you be the panda that can only survive on certain bamboo, in certain areas, and certain regions? Or, you know, a family of, a kind of, a family that's been adapting quite well to different environments, are the sort of, the family of, creatures like the llama and the camel. They're both from the same evolutionary route, but they've slightly adapted towards a wetter environment, a wetter higher altitude environment, or to a more arid environment in terms of the camel. And, you know, we have some tools that are really good, like the, like, and ver but very generic. Who here is in a company that has not used Excel or some form of spreadsheet to manage something because that's a nice general purpose tool that's probably going to survive and live out and outlast almost any other tool that we provide. And I'd like to say that Excel is the biggest functional programming language probably in the world. Functional reactive programming, I could, I could probably say. Um, and so the pandas were very adapted to their environment. They were really successful in that environment for as long as that environment lasted. But humans have been coming along. And again, humans are just about the biggest cataclysm that's been happening to the world. Um, and we've been destroying that habitat quite significantly. So it's taken a very concerted, a big concerted effort to allow them in their specialism to survive. But you can be really, really, really good in that environment. So it's a choice that we have to make. It's a choice these creatures didn't make, but it's a choice that we have to make for our own software. And so nature's been evolving. It's been doing iterative design. It's been like delivering value constantly, as far as we're concerned. But it doesn't really refactor very much. It kind of hopes that sometime this gene will become useful. So one of my favorite things is the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which runs from your jaw all the way down, under your, down your neck, under your aorta, all the way back up your neck and to your brain. 
And this started out when we were fish. And the shortest path between your gills, which formed our jaws, and your brain, and the brain at the time, was a straight line that just happened to pass under the aorta at the time. And then as we've evolved next, the path hasn't changed. And so we've got this kind of very long, slow process. Luckily, it's only to our jaws that, um, like, that affects how we operate, but it hasn't been bad enough. It hasn't caused a serious enough effect for nature to really do anything about it. But it's a beautiful bit of like legacy code that nobody would design a system that way. Nobody would design a giraffe that to make it chew, it would need to go from the brain all the way down that long neck and all the way back up again. Um, and some people develop little pits just by their ears. And these are kind of remnants of gills that's still in our genome. They're not really able to do anything. They're not really useful. They can't operate as gills. But these tiny little pits are just kind of legacy code that's just been activated at some point. So, you know, nature doesn't really deal with it. We can refactor. We can make it. We can actually make our code a lot cleaner and tidier as we go along. But nature just goes, yeah, we'll just have to live with it or die with it. So we've kind of looked at how, we how nature is structured and how it evolves. So what are the kind of things that it actually has produced? What is the architecture of, let's say, a human or most standard mammals? So our organs are very much, I'll say that our organs are very much like services. We've got a hell of a lot of protection built into our systems. We have both direct communication and a pub-sub architecture. We have a learning architecture and kind of it's fairly adapt the architecture is fairly adaptable. So I'll try and show all of these things. So, you know, our organs. Look at almost every mammal. In fact, look at most invertebrates, and you will find that they have, all, most vertebrates will have a skeletal structure. They'll have a brain. They'll have a heart. They'll have lungs. They'll have liver, kidneys. All of these things have appeared over time. And most of them have roughly one function. You know, I'm going to say people will correct me about this all the time. There are plenty of other functions like the pancreas produces not just about age digestion, but also produces insulin and various other things. But you could say that, like, mostly single responsibility principle. You know, your lungs are there to exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen. Your heart is there to make sure that things get pumped around the system. They can work roughly independently of each other. So long as the other systems do their job, they can actually continue. They will do their job quite happily. And, you know, when we think about that, you think, so we're a microservice architecture. Um, and when you think about it in that way, the cells have become specialized to do one job. They're not the cell that is there, like the yeast cell that is um, kind of meant to find its own food digest its own food and you know what what goes into my sourdough right now you know it's basically they're doing it's um it's having to perform everything itself whereas our heart cells they're expecting something else to come along and provide it with the food that it needs to provide it with the oxygen that it needs but it can, but then the heart cells can focus on pumping blood which is what they do. Um, and I kind of will argue that we are the worm, that most of it from our, like, our digestive tract is still the worm, but probably we originated from many, many billions of, like, millions of years ago. Um, and that 
the skeleton evolved around it to make it easy for it to find food. Our organs have grown to make it the more complicated, like the um, organism has become, the more structured the architecture is needed to be. And this is probably a parallel for our systems that we didn't start out like as this system. We started out as single celled organisms and then a couple of cells worked together and then a couple of more cells worked together. But the more they did that structure, the more they had to start breaking out specialities. And as I say, I think they are a loosely coupled architecture. Oops. Um, so I say loosely coupled in like in the fact that they don't need each other to survive. Like the heart can beat without the lungs if you provide another source of oxygen. How we package them together means that they're tightly coupled, means that you actually need a surgeon to go in and slice somebody open to replace their heart or something like that. And that they're not, it's not easy to replace them. You've got to find people with like genetic matches and to be of the right blood type. And then you've got to put them on um, immunosuppressants. But so we don't have to do that in our systems. We don't have to be as like, we can do one better than nature. We could rewrite the heart and plug it into our system and the world should not change. So long as we've got good API tests and contract tests and various other things, which nature doesn't really produce too well, but you know, we can actually make loosely coupled distributed systems that are scaled independently. Notice also that the architecture produces a lot of redundancy. So our lungs, there are two of them. So we can lose one or have one damaged and we can still function our kidneys. For certain things, this biology has gone, I don't know how to do that. Two brains in the same body, both trying to control you and things would not work very well. Potentially, you could have two stomachs, but somehow nature's evolved, but nature's worked out what is, what is kind of essential and what needs to be um, redundant what doesn't need to be redundant so we've got a standard architecture here we've got some really nice services that know what they're doing um we have our skin which is a really good protective defensive barrier we have um sensory organs which are there to help us identify threats food so we've got so much that our system has actually produced that has many parallels to what our own systems are doing. I would say that we are also pretty good at protecting a standard. Um, so, you know, protect your inputs, people. If somebody is sending you some data, you probably want to make sure that that data is not corrupted in any way, shape, or form. You probably want to protect it at the input. So our eyes, our ears, our mouths, our nose, they all have mechanisms to prevent foreign bodies from invading us. Um, so, for example, our tears contain lysosome, which is, helps to break down bacteria before it even gets into our body. Um, and once, but should something get within the body, again, we've got a huge array of weapons by which we can fight an invasion. So our antibodies can help fight viral, fungal, bacterial infections. They can do this by either attaching themselves to the invading body and identifying it for, um, um, to be removed by our white cells. They can bind to the waste products, the damaging waste products of an invading cell. And as I say, they can, um, we also have the white blood cells. 
which are designed to engulf and destroy invading organisms. But it's not just a case that these are all flooding around our system all the time. What happens is a lot more subtle. We detect an infection, and when we detect the infection, our bodies start automatically responding and producing more of the things that are needed to fight that infection. So for me, I think we can learn from nature in saying that it's not just about make it saying that, ah, we've got an Nginx HTTPS gateway in front of us, we're fine. Or going, I accept that um, like at our standard APIs, we've protected against people sending um, malicious data to us. You should be protecting internally as well. And we should be building systems that are designed to respond automatically to any threats that are internal or external. We should be able to start detecting and measuring those systems because this means that we are able to respond far quicker. Because if you've got to wait for, effectively, if you've got to wait for the brain to respond, it's already quite damaging because the brain is quite slow at thinking about what it should do. Um, so the brain doesn't control any of this. These are just autonom autonomous systems within our bodies that will do the right thing at the right time. So we have some things that are just direct communication. So again, our sensory systems get wired directly into the brain. Um, and there's a lot of input. If you imagine all the nerve endings that are probably in your body, how many nerve endings there are in your retinas, how many sensory like smell receptors that you have, there's a lot of information that our, our brains are, based, are trying to process. So our brains don't process it. There's the direct communication coming in, but our brains are kind of exceptional pattern matching systems. So therefore what they're looking for is differences from the norm. So if you suddenly, suddenly see something passing through the screen, your eyes will shift to that without you reacting to it. But a sudden change will make you respond in a certain way, like make your body respond to that. But also um, our brain says signals back to, back to us. And we do a lot of signal processing. But how does this affect our reflexes? So occasionally I've been known to touch a hot, like to put the pan on or put the hob on and forget and accidentally touch it, like touch the hob. And it's stupid and I shouldn't do it, and, but everybody does it. But before my brain knows it, my hand is already moving away because the signal, we've developed something that I think I don't see that much in our systems right now, which is the reflex, which is a localized response to a certain sensory input. So we're still waiting for, so you don't wait for the large, for the brain to get in all the information before you move forward. The, body, the, the systems have evolved to go, if I get this pain receptor, just start moving the hand, it's completely overridable if you want to override it, but like if you like somebody's life depended on it, I could stand with my hand on that hot surface and hold it there, but I probably wouldn't want to normally. So the reflexes are kind of localized um, responses. Even if you're sending the inventor, even if you're publishing a message and saying something's going wrong, you can still have that localized response while um, something else is working out what to do. And that could, that something else could be a human, alert a human about what to do, and the human can make a decision. But that response can sometimes be too slow. So you want to try and produce localized responses. And we also have, as a secondary thing, our endocrine system, which is, as far as I'm concerned, pub sub. Um, I get scared, immediately 
an alert gets sent to my adrenal glands that start producing um, cortisol and adrenaline. Now, different parts of my body, the cells are, the cells are listening for cortisol and adrenaline. And so my heart will start beating faster the instant I get, it receives these messages. My brain will start shutting down extra functions so that it puts more effort into the sensory systems and the basic fight, flight and fight systems. Um, my, even your digestive system will respond by stopping digestion. Because right now, your, your energy needs to be on the critical issue that's the critical event that's happening that's causing these stress hormones to be released. So hormones are effectively messages that's going on to it, let's go, that's been published into our bloodstream. And anyone who knows or any cell that wants to respond to them can listen and respond. So It's not just systems that's designed by nature don't just have one way of doing something. They have multiple ways of doing it. They have multiple messaging protocols. You can have direct communication, you can have pub sub, and I think good systems probably contain all of them. So kind of use the right tool for the right job. And also we, we are basically a learning machine. As I said, our brains are amazing at pattern matching. We can learn over time by constant reinforcement that a new skill, a new weight, that it becomes almost second nature. And I think this is something that we are still at the very early days of how to build learning architectures, and we still have a long way to go on this one. But through lots of concentration, effort, and repetition, we can teach ourselves to play music. And what you'll notice is the amount of effort that your brain feels like it's putting in once you, when you're starting out seems immense because it's having to control more of the muscles. It's having to think about where it's going to put the hands and the fingers as you're producing things, as you're producing the music. When you're a concert pianist and you've spent years training your hands, you look at a piece of sheet music and your hands are automatically flying to where they need to be. You're not having to think about that. You're now thinking more about intonation, how loud and, um, and how um, you're expressing the music rather than on the physical acts that you've done. So we can train until we be, things become instinctive. But at the same time, you know, we can learn biases just like everybody else, like just like, like artificial intelligence systems. We're all trained to be biased in some way. But we are also hopefully trained by society to have a bit of empathy that we don't have to respond immediately to things. And we often don't. We often, the pattern matching part of our brain goes away and says, this is the answer. And then kind of your frontal lobes, your prefrontal cortex, which actually does a lot of your rational thinking, comes along and goes, if I do this, this is going to hurt somebody. And that would be bad because it thinks about the consequences of the actions, things that we haven't built into machines yet. I don't think we've built machine empathy, which would be a brilliant system if we could find out how to do it. Um, so we can choose to go against our own instinct and even go against our own like self-preservation instincts because we can, we can actually rationalize from a very different perspective to the way that machines can at the moment. And I think that's partly because we train machine learning algorithms on to do a very specific task, whereas we are generalists again. We can't just deal with image processing or speech recognition, or any of the th other things that we do, we have to be able to, we can train, we train ourselves constantly by life to be very, um, with thousands of different data sets from thousands of different scenarios. And we can apply learnings from different worlds into our own world. 
which is things that I think we haven't yet learned when we're dealing with AI. So understanding the learning architecture of the human brain would be a fantastic thing. And I don't think a, an experiment that I don't want to do because it would be bad would be to raise a child only knowing pictures of like different types of cat. Because we did that, they did that with a machine um, learning algorithm. They trained it to identify jaguars, leopards, and cheetahs based on the based on the shape of their spots. Then they put a leopard print sofa on there, and it went, "It's a leopard." Now, I don't think if you trained a human brain purely on that, as I say, a really bad experiment. Don't ever do this. This is really, really bad. But if you trained a human brain on that one, I'm not sure that if you showed them a sofa, they'd go, that's a leopard. I think there'd be other things that we were picking up on that the machine hasn't. And kind of, we are a very adaptable standard architecture. So as I say, we've almost every vertebrate on the planet has the basic architecture of a skeleton heart, lungs, kidneys, liver. The fact that we can produce the vast diversity of life from this actually comes back to um, the idea that the architecture should not be the thing that holds you back. The architecture of your system should be the thing that sets you free. We should be able, like, a heart can go from the tiniest mouse to a blue whale's heart. It's the same basic structure, but just done on a vastly different scale. Um, so I would ask people in general to like really think about what your architecture is and how it enables you to be this flexible and whether you have one architecture or whether you have a few standard architectures. But if we're not thinking about the architecture, then we can't be set free by it. So kind of what can we learn from nature? I think start simple and iterate. I think that's been a general theme among software for a while now, but start simple and iterate is probably good. However, sometimes I see us falling into the trap of each generation isn't viable in itself. So if it doesn't provide value to a customer, that customer has to be vastly invested in you to keep go to keep supporting you until it becomes viable for them. So you have to make it so that the generation is viable to keep producing some value to your, enough value to your customers that they will give you money for you to produce the next generation. We shouldn't just try one thing. We should try multiple variations. And that as you grow in complexity, you're going to need to increase the structure of your system and the architecture of your system. But that architecture should be flexible. It should be secure by default and reasonably pragmatic. I don't want to get into anybody going, well, this microservice has two roles and go, calm. If it wants to split, it will split later. But let's just make sure that we've actually delivered a viable iteration first. And I think some of these things, a lot of the stuff like secure by default, scaffolding is the way to make that happen. You know, if I want to produce something onto kind of into my um, system, I should be able to just get something right now that will have all the security in place. If I want to produce a new web service, it should have all the right web service security. It should have some internal monitoring and things like that all built into it, ready to go. I shouldn't have to keep trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. It should be just there. We should accept that change is inevitable. The only thing that doesn't really change is the fact that everything changes. Now, the timescales may change over, may change, but change is going to happen. So we should embrace that in many ways. And we should understand our own biases as best we can. And we're going to make mistakes. We're going to show our biases in ways that we didn't know. 
But then the key to that is then saying, thank you for pointing that out. We'll do better. And what can we do better? Well, we've got a wealth of existing knowledge. We can learn from other um, products that we've worked on, other projects that we've worked on. We've got our own experience that we rely on to build, our, to build other systems. So we, can, we don't have to be random about it. We can actually make sure that we look at things, even failing ideas from other environments and go, well, it didn't work in that environment because of this reason. This environment, it may just be the right thing for us. We can clean our code and our designs. We can take that time to iterate and make things better. And we can sort of leave the next generation of developers a system that is simple, that doesn't have as much horrible legacy built into it. We can understand our place in the ecosystem. So what is happening in the world around us now? What are the side effect things that are changing in our world right now that may even feel like a periphery to us? But we can take a look at and something that I think we should all be doing is having more tests. Like we can actually test that we're not breaking anything. We don't have to um, we don't have to cement ourselves in with those tests because test-driven cement is something that I've seen many times where people create two, the tests are too wrapped up in the how it's implemented, not what it's implemented. But we can make sure that we have tests that actually allow us to move faster by giving us that confidence that we're not creating something that's broken. And sort of life does this more by just going, yep, yeah, you died, sorry, but I'd rather not have that happen. And so my final thoughts, I think many of the problems we face in software have had have parallels in nature. I think most living organisms are immensely complicated or complex distributed systems. I th think that there's a lot more detail I could go into about the structure of the cells and more detail about how organisms form communities and social groups, which again is another thing that we can learn from. There's so much more to explore. As a group, we can actually start looking and taking inspiration from how nature has found these problems and solved these problems. And we can, like even the physical world right now, people are looking at why um, sharks scales make them such are so efficient in the water and they're looking at like sort of uh, nano le like nano level um, um, microscopy to find out why it is what what is it about the surface of the structure or why geckos can walk up a wall which the physical world is taking um, inspiration from the natural world but I think we can too and that is everything. So I hope you liked it. I think we need to get a soundboard for applause at some point. Yeah, I think it'll work. I think we could sell them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian. Does anybody um, have any questions? Obviously, you can feel free to unmute yourself. So I don't have that power anymore. Um, at least I don't think I do. Uh, so yeah, feel free to to do that yourselves. Yeah, it looks like Connell was able to unmute himself. That was uh, really good, Ian, uh, if you don't mind me saying. What was your inspiration for sort of drawing parallels between the natural world and um, the computer computing world? Did, did you just notice the parallels one day and thought that might be an interesting talk, or did your interest go deeper? Um, I'd done a bit of biology at university. Um, and I hadn't really thought about it for a long time. And then just a random thought on a train to Socrates, Belgium. I was on the Eurostar, just sat down, just sort of doodling away. And then I sketched out to a lot of the basic underlying ideas for this talk. 
um, just sort of popped into my head. And it's pretty good because there are more than a few parallels there, aren't there? There are dozens and dozens, like you say. There's way more than I can go into, and there's way more than I know. So there's also things like epigenetics. So that is where um, you don't always express every gene that you have, but some environmental change can cause you to ex start expressing that gene. So this is probably how our cells specialize. So it's kind of like environment variables that have been um, put into the system or put into the cell. Feature flags. Start <laughs> yeah, feature <laughs> flags. So I could have even gone into feature flagging. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different things and like why they, why doctors love testing twins, identical twins, is that sometimes you get different gene expressions just because of a different life event that one twin has had. Cool. Any other questions? Um, it's not really a question, but I could probably word it as a question. Have you ever thought, um, that I'm not a massive fan of biology myself, but I'm well into physics. Have you ever seen or tried to go into the parallels there perhaps with sort of planetary systems or anything like that i guess they're not as complicated as um cells and dna but um i kind of haven't but maybe it is worth looking into like sort of um i mean i kind of like the idea i can't remember who said it now but one physicist maybe dirac said um something like you know when it you know when something feel is right because it feels the equations feel simple. Yeah. Um, beautiful and, code, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of the beautiful coat thing and the beautiful mass thing. That if it feels elegant, if it's an elegant solution, then it's probably physics or ma it's probably the underlying mass of the universe. Mm. I love that. Mm. Uh, you probably read. Um, is it the selfish gene? By is it Richard Dawkins? Did he write that? I have. It's like there's plenty of biology books on my to read list at the moment. Okay. Um, the, 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 the notion of the book's quite uh, an interesting one. It's basically that we've got these genes and they don't care uh, about um, politics or economics or anything like that. They just do whatever they can to survive uh, and they've got more and more advanced and better at, at, at doing it and evolved. And the only reason it evolves is just to to reproduce and just carry on living in future generations. It does make me scared a bit then if, if we start writing code, which is like the equivalent of the selfish gene, <laughs> which, which has not only the ability to replicate, but um, make itself smarter and will do anything at any cost to survive. So that's a scary parallel right there, I thought. Yeah. It's a good book, I, I recommend it. I'll have a read at that one. Um... Like there's a number of books around about sort of the algorithm underlying algorithms of like ant colonies that are really interesting that I've got in my to read list as well, which is why I didn't go into like how social groups form. But like there's a certain thing of going like if I've like certain ants will say if I've smelt um, six people with like six ant other ants smelling like this, I know I've got to go and clear out the waste from the <laughs> nest and like certain little like programming things that they've learned over time to know when it's right time to clean out and do certain actions. Um, and so what the triggers are for things like that. And I think, yeah, we're constantly, um, I constantly love the way that the world, the world's, I've looked at it a bit differently since I've worked, realized that we are just distributed systems. Um, Oh, any other do questions? Think, um, oh, yeah, do, you th do you think nature could learn anything from the software development industry? Well, as I say, I mean, I think that I don't want to really use the term, but we can do intelligent design. Um, that we can actually, we don't have to rely on random chance to make something happen. We can, act, we can put conscious thought into what we're doing and why we're doing it. So I think that, and the fact that we can clean our code bases, we can make sure that things are um, like easier to understand for the next generation. We should be trying to do that. 
I know pressures on us mean that it often doesn't happen and we end up with the mess that we always like I don't think I've ever worked on a system that isn't messy in some way and I don't think I ever will because so I I like to think that I'm writing tomorrow's legacy code today um and but yeah I think that like we can we can always do these things and we can apply experience we can really make that something that like we can move forward with like that we can we're not relearning everything from scratch every single time. I like the idea that um, nature kind of comments its own code out rather than deleting it. Uh, or in fact, puts like a build definition around it, <laughs> leaves it in there. And eventually some it. mutation might make it useful. Yeah. Our jaws were the structure around the gills. <laughs> Our ears probably were the gills. Um, you know, just occasionally. Like, I wouldn't recommend this. I wouldn't recommend taking a JSON parser and turning it into a banking system. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's the, way, that's the way nature decides it wants to do it. Constant evolution rather than designing from scratch all the time. I think that's how a lot of industry works. It's not it's all not that many... Features. Yeah, there's not all that many greenfield stuff that happens. It's nearly always changing stuff that's out there to make it fit the new business requirements, isn't it? So... Yeah, it's too expensive to start from scratch quite often. And maybe sometimes that is something we can do, but I like the um, DHH approach to that though. It's not rewriting it to be feature parity for feature parity. It's rewriting it to be a new system to live in a new ecosystem. So he's written like Basecamp one, I believe is still running for those people that really like Basecamp 1 and are willing to pay for it. Then they've gone to Basecamp 2 and Basecamp 3. But they're all different ways to do what they like to do that to do that system. They're not trying to be feature compatible. Uh, right, I'm conscious that um, time's marching on a bit. If you wanted to just nip off and uh, if you needed the toilet or go for, refill your glasses then we can do that and we'll get going at 10 past if that works for, for Lee. Um, so that gives everybody enough time to go and turn themselves around. <laughs> or you can just stay here and talk. It's perfectly acceptable. I'm going to get a glass of water. Back in five. Yep, good plan. My PC How often decides. do you do your doodles, Ian? Um, I doodle quite a bit. Um, I'm doing a D&D game at the moment and I sketch note every D&D game, like every D&D awesome. session. Um, and yeah, I try and do more. As I say, I drew the stormtroopers behind me, um, which I was quite surprised about how well they turned out. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think it's just trying things out. I still claim I'm not an artist. Um, <laughs> Your sketch notes would say otherwise. <laughs> but yeah, I I kind of like doing the slides. I think right, most of the writing being actual typed is still quite nice because it's easy to read. So this was another experiment in how to do slides. I find drawing helps as a memory aid with speaking. I don't know about you. Yeah, but they say drawing when you're listening to somebody talk is a great memory aid. Even if you're just doodling and doing nothing, like literally just like scribbling anything, some part of it seems to, you'd have more memory retention if you're doodling than if you're just sat listening. Um, I found at university all that many, many years ago, that if the lecturer had given us class notes to have during the class and I was able to annotate them, I, I retained the information that made more sense than if I had to keep my own notes from scratch. Um, probably because sort of the higher level stuff was already there and I could, I could doodle almost yeah. around that. So you were taking in what he was saying and what was in the notes, you were processing them and then yeah. adding your own annotations. And that's why I find sketch noting is good because you're having to process the information to make it into a sketch note. Mm -hmm. But if you're just like, I can do user calls right now 
and I can be the person sort of doing the transcribing. And I can type as fast as people talk, but not a single word is going into my head. <laughs> it's kind of just bypassing the brain and going straight to my fingers and I'm just typing away. Whereas if I sketch note it, I can actually go, oh, and then they said this and then they did this and yeah. I can really get into the detail. And that's exactly it. I think certainly if there was no notes, I remember scribbling everything down so I didn't want to miss anything and it just didn't go in at all. Nothing went in because all your concentration was just not not losing your track. Because if you did that, then you'd miss bits out and it wouldn't make any sense. But if the broad strokes are already there and I guess if the speaker's got slides as the equivalent, then you can just embellish upon that. And yeah, and also like with the sketch notes, sometimes people do you put like talk too fast and you just have to go, oh well. Um, <laughs> And you take down what you've, um, you take down what you can. And it's almost a lesson in not being perfect or not try aiming for the perfect is do the best that you can. Um, yeah, that sounds fun. Do you think it'd be good if um, speakers sort of live streamed their slides so that you could use them to sketch note on top of? Would that be something that... Um, Possibly not because I tend to have a very specific style of how I do things and yeah. stuff. Um, Imagine it would depend on the speaker as well, right? Because a lot of people put a lot of text on their slides, uh, whereas yeah. I'm the opposite. I'd literally have one image, but I'd just, a lot of people wouldn't have you have any room for you to draw on top of, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but you know, there's quite a bit of really bad stuff that happens, so. <laughs> my little panda oh, and skeletons. Panda. <laughs> um, yeah, I have like my place is full of papers from writing this um, talk. Oh, do you do I all like your that. sketches on paper or do you do any digital drawing at all? The stormtroopers, um, they are um, when Zoom works out. <laughs> there we go. Um, like the stormtroopers were done on the iPad. Um, I have a couple of stormtrooper, um, like, um, kind of mini statue, like posable figures that I can play with. And so I put them into some poses and I tried just sketching them. Good. My um my son is an E four and he loves Star Wars and he's we got some cats and he actually named one of them Stormtrooper, which is so pretty. Funny. When we ever go to the uh, the vets and they have to call people in, they always say about the animals' names, so they say Stormtrooper Engelstone. <laughs> always a bit embarrassing. Oh, all right. Let's um, switch over now to Leeds to talk about augmented reality. Thank you very much, Ian, for your talk and uh, the questions then after that. And uh, yeah, over to you. Thanks. Cheers, Ian. Uh, and cheers, Pete. I'm going to try uh, and full screen. I'm not a Zoom expert, so let me know if I'm not sharing. Hang on. That's not right. I think I need the share screen button. Da, 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 yeah. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. We can see, yes. Yes, brilliant. Uh, and if I jump across to here, sorry, I've just got a few virtual desktops in play. <laughs> uh, I just need to line them up. There's, my videos need to be up there, you see. Okay, videos up there, and then possibly code windows in the wrong way up there. Okay. Cool. I think. <laughs> I think that's everything. Right, okay. Love these virtual desktops. Uh, you could just, we're just showing you how you can rename them, can't you? Um, you can- Yeah, that's you, right. That's yeah, that's really, new. Really useful. Anyway, I shall jump to my first slide. It's a good start at the beginning. Uh, so thanks uh, for having me, Pete, and thanks everyone for turning up this evening. Really excited uh, to be here tonight to, to talk about something that I think is really, really interesting and I don't think gets shouted about enough. Uh, and I don't think many .NET developers know that they can create 
augmented reality experiences. So hopefully after this, you will have a bit more knowledge of how to do that. Uh, as a bit of a background to talk, I'm a, a .NET developer, like a lot of you, um, but I wanted to do some mobile development. Uh, I started doing Windows Phone development, but you know how that went. And then uh, I wanted to do some iOS stuff. So I got went out and got a Mac, and I didn't get very far into doing uh, mobile development for iOS until I saw this augmented rally stuff and thought, oh, I'd like to have a go at that. And I didn't have three and a half thousand pounds to pay for a um, HoloLens. So I, I found that uh, um, the iOS has an augmented reality framework called ARKit, and you could, you could write code and do it that way. So that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what this talk is about. And, uh, so just for um, just to set some ex expectations, there's a few things we're not going to be talking about today. Uh, HoloLens, um, except to say that we're not talking about it, um, Mixed Reality Toolkit, Unity, Virtual Reality, AR Core, or Web AR. These are all great technologies. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them. Uh, I'm sure they've got great use cases. I'm just, um, that's not what this talks about. So if you've come here, uh, looking to hear about some then, then I'm sorry, maybe in a future talk. Uh, if, 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 Microsoft, if Microsoft want to send me HoloLens, I will happily write a talk about it. Um, anyway, okay, so on the left here is me just wearing the HoloLens at a, a conference that I decided to rock. Is that handsome rogue there? Okay, so next slide. Hmm, that's not advancing the slide. There we go. So, I've been to a few of these talks and I, I, what that generally happens is you talk about the basics, then you look at some code and then you, you look at what you, the output, the, the final product of all that at the very end. So I thought I'd turn that on its head and show right at the very beginning a video of um, some of these experiences that I'm talking about. Now, when this has been recorded previously, it's been a bit laggy. So hopefully when you're playing back on Zoom, it's a bit smoother. But if it is a bit laggy, I can point you into the a place where you can see these videos in a bit more a bit more smoother. So the top left uh, is just showing 2D planes with images on. It's several rows of them with a slightly different radius and then angled in towards the center and therefore looking a bit like a sphere. I call it a, a 3D photosphere. Uh, the top right is just, would you believe it or not, just seven transparent PNGs just placed with X, X, Y, Z positions uh, just suspended in midair, and it's quite a nice effect. Uh, the bottom left is using image detection, and that is uh, when it's detecting the image in the scene, it's placing a 3D model on the image, and then when you orientate that image, it's orientating the 3D model as well. And the bottom right is showing uh, how you can do some animations in augmented reality. And I'll probably go into at least these bottom two. If, uh, and we're going to talk about the concepts that allow us to build these experiences. My notes have dispersed. That's the taste of video. Okay, so the obligatory about me slide. Uh, my name is Lee Engelson, as Pete said. I'm the software development manager at leasing.com. I'm on Twitter at Lee Engelson. I'm on GitHub, LinkedIn, YouTube. I have a, a blog, uh, my personal blog is at manchesterdeveloper.com where I just blog about development stuff uh, in general. Uh, I've got another website where I've collated a bunch of tips for Visual Studios, including animated GIFs and videos. So if you're a .NET developer, you might want to check that out. And I've been recording my experiments with combining Xamarin and ARKit into one place on, on this website, xamarinarkit.com. And all the things you'll see here you would see videos and explanations and code of it on that website as well. Okay, so I've, I've broken this talk into three parts. The first part goes into the background of augmented reality. What do we mean by that? What is Xamarin? What is ARKit? That's by, by far the smallest part. Uh, then I move on to the business of augmented reality. Where do we, do I see it being in the future? Uh, how is anyone ever going to make any business, uh, sorry, any money out of it? What's some of the use cases for it? And then in part three, which is by and far the largest, is uh, we pop the hood and we start looking at maybe some of the code or some of the, the things that make these augmented reality uh, 
experience is possible. So I have given this talk only once before and it did overrun quite a bit. So I'm gonna try and show you less code samples. Um, so if you see me skipping over some code sample, that's all it is, just for brevity really. Okay, so on to, to part one, the background. So I looked at a few definitions of augmented reality. I didn't really care for any of them. I thought they're a bit complicated. So I thought, well, how could I explain it to my mum? How if, she, if my mum's turned around to me one day, don't know why she would, and said, Lee, what, what, is, what is augmented reality? I, I'd say, this is why I describe it as, it's making something look like it is there that isn't actually there. And I'll stand by that. That's probably the best description I can have of augmented reality. So it's not to be confused with virtual reality. In virtual reality, we put a headset on and your vision is a completely occluded and everything that you see is a product of a program that's running. Um, whereas in augmented reality, you can still see the world around you, but there's a program running which is inserting 3D objects into that spa uh, space. So those are the differences. Uh, sometimes you'll see phrases like XR um, and mixed reality thrown in there. And they're just sort of general, generalizations for both of them, I think. Okay, so, right. What is ARKit? So, um, it's Apple's augmented reality framework, which runs on iOS devices, and it uses a very clever magical thing called visual inertial odometry, which I struggle to explain, but I'll give it a go. So what it's doing is, as you hold your camera up, um, it's combining the input from your some hardware in your phone, that's the odometry and the accelerometer, as well as taking each frame of the camera that it's seeing, using computer vision to pick out interest points and trying to figure out where, where they've changed, the positions have changed in between the frames and combine all that together, it can try and figure out uh, as you move the camera around, it can, it can see uh, interest points it's taken note of. And if you place something in the scene, as you pan back around to it, it, it's like, it says to itself, oh, I know you, you placed an inflatable penguin there. I need to show that when you, when you pan back that way. It's magic, basically, just, I'll just say it's magic. Um, ARKit was ported, among other things, to .NET by Xamarin, which allows us to write C Sharp and um, to call the underlying uh, hardware on iOS devices. And it's not to be confused with ARCore, which is Android's version, uh, their augmented reality uh, framework, of which I know next to nothing, so I can't field any questions about that. Uh, speaking of questions, if you won't mind holding them to the end, because I've got quite a lot to get through, um, and I would be more than happy to answer them then, if that's okay. Right, so what is Xamarin? So a few of you might know what it is, but just to make sure everyone's on a sort of a level pegging, it started off life as sort of a cross-platform app development tool set, where you could write C-sharp and deploy it to a number of devices, like uh, platforms like iOS and Android. The company Xamarin was acquired by Microsoft in 2016. And since then, they've, they've rolled that functionality into Visual Studio so you can create cross-platform applications and target these um, different platforms with, with the same code base and just by writing C Sharp. Uh, yeah, so that's Xamarin. Okay, so that actually concluded part one, which was the, um, the, uh, the, the background of augmented reality. So moving swiftly on to the, I told you it was small. Uh, so moving swiftly on to the to part two, the, the business of augmented reality. And whenever I talk about augmented reality to, to people, both technical and non-technical, it sort of polarizes them. Um, and I thought different people's responses are captured quite well by these animated memes from, from Dragon's Den. Got Peter Jones in the top right saying, I, I don't get it. You know, I, I, just, I just don't get it. Why would you want to do that? which is fine. Some people might not like the idea of augmented reality or be able to make something appear there that's not actually there. That's fine. Um, then another dragon here is saying, okay, it's impressive, I get it. Um, it's cool, it's, it's neat, it's nifty, running out of synonyms, um, but I, you know, I'm not sure how useful it is. Uh, so that you get that sort of response sometimes, which is again, fine. And then you get people on the other end of the spectrum that says, that say, oh my God, this, this is amazing. This is 
the be next best thing. This is going to change all the markets, all the industries. You know, this is this is the next biggest thing. So, um, I'm quite optimistic personally. That's why I've right, written a, a slide deck on it. Okay. So then um, we can talk a little bit about a little augmented reality game called Pokemon Go, which came out about five years ago, I think. And for me, this was, um, I don't know if you've ever played this, uh, by the way. I, I've not played this, but I know a few people get obsessed by it, as, <laughs> as you can see. Um, I don't know if you've got like a, um, like a level 20 Bulbasaur or something, and someone's just put something in the chat to make sure that I can... Uh, Oh, okay, just checking you could hear me. Just think I didn't want to someone to say, oh, just see your mouth moving for the last five minutes. <laughs> yeah, so I've never actually played this, so I'll admit to that. Um, but the, some of the figures that um, around this are, are staggering. So in the first 20 days, it made $100 million. In the first month, it made $207 million. And for me, this is when sort of augmented reality sort of came of age. It proved to me that not only are people uh, uh, willing to move the phone around and make things appear that aren't actually there, that they, they quite like doing that. It's quite quite fun and engaging. And they're also willing to pay for, for, the, for the privilege of doing that. So for me, that's, um, that was a big turning point for that. Uh, another statistic of that, I think, um, they've captured something like 144 billion steps that people have moved around in that app. Anyway, going there, Pokemon, crazy. So, uh, the next slide is also on Pokemon, but don't worry, the whole presentation is not about Pokemon. Okay, so it's not just a fluke. Uh, so to date, uh, I've not got the figures for 2020, but we're looking at around in the last four or five years, Pokemon Go, this, this little augmented reality game, one of the first augmented reality games that, that people created has made about $3 billion to date. A billion with a B, not an M. Uh, but it's not just games and entertainment. I'm gonna show you some use cases, uh, some regular business use cases. We're starting to see a lot of people creating uh, wearable experiences. So here we can see an example where someone is trying on glasses frames. These, uh, and they can say, oh, I want a red frame, I want thicker frames, and they can just look at the camera and they can try them on without actually ever having to leave the comfort of the home, which is quite useful if you're in lockdown and there's a, the, the world is ending because of a plague. You don't really want to go out in the shops just to try spectacles on. Uh, okay, but the, it's not just glasses. There's other things I've seen people build things to try and I've, I've seen apps where you can try watches and uh, jewelry and, and rings as well. So there's a few wearables use cases. I have tried this app and this is called the Wanna Kicks app. And it, what this allows you to do is choose a shoe from a catalog then point it at your foot, and you're probably best off taking your shoes off to try this, and it will show you what that shoe looks like on your foot. And you can move your foot around, um, try on the shoes, and you, your partner can say, what on earth are you doing? And you can say, look at this, I can try different shoes on, um, my smelly bare feet, um, without actually having to, to go to JD Sports or wherever you buy your shoes. So yeah, try this app. Um, if you get bored with this talk, try it, just download it, try it, or preferably afterwards. But do try it and it might change your mind about augmented reality. So we're also seeing manufacturers creating 3D models of their products. And we're also seeing file formats spring up that manufacturers can produce these 3D models and they can host them on their website. And then a user can go onto their website, click a button and say, I want to see what this product looks like in my home. And then it will activate your camera and it will show that 3D model on a, a table or wherever you point your camera. And we're even seeing guidance here from this screenshot from Google to say, how do you want to, if you want these USDZ file formats, which is the popular one for, the, for this sort of thing, um, indexed, this is this is what you can do, and this is where you should put them. And if you, even in the straight in the search results, the, the Google search results on the left here, you can click a button that says view in 3D. Um, and you can view it in, in your space as well. So that's becoming uh, more popular. Um, I'm gonna stop short of talking about web AR because it's A, not something I've looked at and B, slightly verging off from, from what this talk is about. So 
Uh, so far, we've talked about augmented reality experiences on our phones, on our mobile devices, which makes sense because they're very, very powerful devices, uh, very extremely powerful, uh, and they're getting more and more powerful. Uh, but they've also got very sophisticated cameras on. These days, it's not uncommon for some devices to have as many as four little lenses on the back of the camera. Um, but for me, when where people are finally going to think augmented reality is, is amazing is when these augmented reality glasses start hitting the market. And these have been promised for a while. Don't get me wrong, the, the hype cycle of augmented reality is nowhere near as long as, as augmented reality, uh, sorry, virtual reality. People have been talking about virtual reality for the last 20, 15, 20 years. Uh, augmented reality, I think, still at the beginning of its hype stage a little bit. Um, but uh, we even got Apple producing uh, their own uh, augmented reality glasses. So I think the, if we've got dozens and dozens of manufacturers, uh, there's not just a few manufacturers, there are loads of manufacturers all scrambling to be first to market to produce these, this hardware that we can run these augmented reality experiences in. And it's going to be software developers like us that's going to be writing the software for these things. Just, just bear that in mind, um, which again, opens us up to a whole degree of freedom. We're, at the moment, we're, we're, we're programming for a what, 2D space on a little screen like this or like this. Just imagine programming interact uh, user interfaces for something where you've got 360 degree uh, um, freedom. And I think uh, the glasses are going to be what um, breaks our, little, uh, our love affair with uh, our little black screens um, devices. Okay, yes. So this is my last slide on the business of AR, and then we'll get on to the implementation details. Okay, so let me just get a pen like to underline things. We talked about drawing, didn't we? Uh, okay, so I think this is my formula for what is gonna make or break augmented reality. And I think it's success rise on these, mainly these four factors, I'm sure there's another, another factors, but these ones. Uh, so I think we've proven that we've probably got that didn't activate the pen, sorry. Pen, pen, got it. Uh, we've got the customers. Uh, you just got to look at Pokemon Go uh, and, and things like that. The customers are willing and, and able uh, to, to, to use augmented reality experiences. I think we've got the software to write these sort of experiences. We've got AR Kit, we've got AR Core for Android. We have got HoloLens and the, the mixed reality framework. We have got... Um, uh, Unity, and we have got uh, other uh, providers, things people like Facebook have created their own flavor of, of software, like uh, I think it's called Spark AI, you can create AR experiences uh, uh, using that. The, I think we've got the, the businesses are starting to wake up um, and pay attention to augmented reality, even just to get first to market, uh, but they're starting to look at return investment of these, these augmented reality um, experiences. There's companies like uh, is it Bank van Olufsen? I can never say it. The, the people that make the sound systems on their website, I think you, they did a, uh, you, you can say, what does this speaker or this sound system look like in my home? And I think Mulberry, yeah, Burberry. I would say Blueberry. Burberry, uh, who make these sort of high-end designer bags, I think. I think you can choose it and you can see what it looks like on your desk before you go out and buy it. So I think the businesses are catching on. And then we've got uh, our phones, but I think the hardware is starting to catch up. And I think it's, it's gonna be when these, these AR classes hit the market that this whole th formula starts uh, making money and um, we're all gonna turn into a, uh, AR developers as, as most of us are turning into cloud developers. Um, okay, so that's my last slide on the business of AR. Onto the implementation. So we're gonna pop the hood a look at um, some of the code and, and some of the experiences, but not too much code because that takes ages. These are my funniest slides I could find, about, sorry, from its funniest memes I could find about popping the hood. Um, uh, but here it says, it doesn't look like much, but it's souped up and you've got pictures of Campbell's soup and these chaps here just say, yep, it's an engine. And I know you think your jokes are less funny when you have to explain them, but I'm not comedian. Okay, so I'm going to breeze past setting up your environment because it could take a while just to explain it, but I'll go through the very, very basics. So you don't need a paid Apple developer account to develop these things onto your phone. If you want to deploy to the Apple 
um, Apple Store, then you will need a paid developer app. But if you're just messing around, you just need your Apple ID, okay? So the next thing we need to do is, uh, you need a Mac. I think I mentioned this beginning, I hope I did. We're not at the point yet that we can build and deploy this without there being a Mac involved. You can have a Mac on the network or you can write directly on the Mac. Um, but uh, you do need a Mac for, for this reason. So what I've been doing, and people could, if, I'm, if there's another way of doing it, great. Um, but what I've been doing is I've been creating a blank project in Xcode, deploying it to, on, on my Mac, deploying it to my mobile device. What that does, it creates and deploys the code provisioning and signing certificates. And then sort of put that project to the side because I'm not really doing anything with it now. Then I open up Visual Studio for Mac and I carry on. Uh, making sure I reuse the same bundle ID that I used in Xcode, uh, the Xcode project, and using it in my Visual Studio for Mac project, then I can just write my C Sharp code and do everything in, in .NET in Visual Studio for Mac. Caveat for that, however, is that um, the, the self-signed permissions, so, sorry, the self-signed certs, I think run out after about seven or 10 days. So you will need to redeploy the Xcode uh, project back onto the device to carry on. Um, unless you have the paid Apple developer account, then I think these certs either stay on uh, indefinitely or um, a lot longer anyway. So these are the project types you want. On the left is Xcode, you want this single view app. Uh, this is how I've been doing it. Again, I'm sure there are other ways of doing it. This is just how I've, I've been doing it. You don't want this augmented reality app for the way I've been doing it. And then in uh, Visual Studio for Code, uh, you want this single view app here and this app iOS section here and making sure to reuse the bundle ID um, and the, uh, code, so this, the, the certs and the code signing provisioning stuff that you created in Xcode. Okay. So, so that's with the, the setup and the environment. I don't want to go into too much detail, like I said. So it's worth talking about seeing kit at this point, because whilst AR kit is the framework that's maintaining this, this uh, the camera view, and as you're moving around, it's maintaining position and it's understanding of, of the world, it's actually seeing kit in a lot of the samples I'm going to show you that we're going to be using, because we're going to be dropping actual uh, objects and spheres and, and planes and doing animations and all that comes from scene kit just to come from our kit they, they we're going to work use these together so scene kit is apple's 3d graphics framework and it incorporates this physics engine and a particle generator which i've not played around with a particle generator it sounds like something from cern but uh it, i want to play with that it sounds quite cool physics stuff we do we do actually go into a little bit in this talk and like I said, we're going to use things, some things from SceneKit in, in the next few examples, including geometry, materials, lights, uh, and no, I don't use cameras, but there's one certainly. So just to hammer home the fact that we're going to use aspects of SceneKit and ARKit to create these experiences, everything in green is actually from SceneKit. We've got some actions here, what I'll refer to as animations later. I've got some geometries here, which are kind of just like basic shapes and um, some other stuff here, lights and materials and geometries and nodes. Uh, and they're all from SceneKit. And then we've got some things like tracking anchors and sessions and anchors and uh, these more configurations here. They're all from ARKit, we'll talk about that. That's not my picture. Um, that was, this is from a chap called Ryan. So thank you, Ryan, for that. I couldn't have drawn a better diagram if I tried, so I didn't. Okay. So then if we start looking at some of the objects that make this sort of thing possible, we will look at some code uh, to, for these experiences. And the main thing that makes this the magic happen is this AR scene view. And what that does is when you start this, when you place this view into your app and you start the session on that view, it starts this visual inertia odometry and it starts making a uh, sense of the world around you, looking for in points of interest and thinking, oh, I've got to remember that. And when you when you come back around, you say, well, oh, that's, that's that point of interest, um, whether it's a plane or a wall or an image that you've told it to detect, um, it kind of keeps it all um, remembers, for want of a better word, uh, where you put it. And that all happens as this session's running. And that's, yeah, blending the camera, with with the 3d content okay we talked about this session 
in the last slide, uh, fuses and vertebral anchors to map surroundings. Okay, so when you run the session, and we'll look at this in the code briefly, uh, you pass it in a type of configuration and the type of configuration you pass it depends on the capabilities you want in this augmented reality scene. If you want to be detecting images, you might pass it a different configuration than if you want to be detecting faces or objects. And uh, also mention that the accuracy of this session's ability to point, pick out points of interest depends on environmental conditions. And what I mean by that is, you need half decent lighting because um, if it's not got that, it's we're going to really struggle uh, to figure that um, wh where these things are. So you need quite good lighting, and you don't want reflect, and you want you don't want reflective materials like mirrors or glasses. It, it struggles to to understand those things. Okay, anchors again. We talked a little bit about so as your session's running and it's it's finding items in the scene of interest. It, it starts putting these anchors, invisible anchors, uh, in in the in the scene. And just, oh, my you can manually place these, or more commonly, what we can do is we can detect them. So we can we can get it so that if it detects a tabletop or a, or a wall or something, then um, it's going to drop a plane anchor. If it detects an image, we've told it to detect it will drop an image anchor. If it detects a face, it's going to detect a face anchor. I think you see the pattern. Okay, so that's anchors, and then move, move on to some more, uh, some more basics. At this point, I normally show a code example about uh, just a bog standard session running, but I'm going to skip past this because we're going to look at that code when we look at code later. But I'll remember to, to point these out. So, for for brevity and not to go on for too long, I'm going to skip that that code sample. But what we'll talk about is the three D coordinate system which is interesting. So these sizes, um, these are all, again, from, from scene kit. These, these have nothing to do with AR kit, we're just using scene kit in our augmented reality experiences. So a value of one F, and these are float values, is one meter, which is easy to remember. So that means a value of 0.01F is 10 centimeters, and a value of 0.01F is one centimeter. So if you create a cube, which is one F, wide, deep, and long, you're going to have a, a, a cube that's that's a meter squared, ah, meter cubed, beg your pardon. So then we have an X, Y, Z coordinate system where X is side to side, Y is up and down, uh, and Y is generally uh, straight down, so to, to mimic gravity, and Z is backwards and forwards. I say backwards and forwards, not <laughs> forwards and backwards for a reason, to remind me to mention a gotcha. Now, if you're starting off with this, this might trip you up. If you, you'll notice that the Z index, the positive Z index is behind you and the, the negative Z index is in front of you. So if you place something with a, the Z, in, Z value of, my, of one F, one meter, it's gonna, and you think, oh, it's gonna be one meter in front of me, it's gonna be one meter behind you. Um, and <laughs> you won't believe how long that took me to, to figure out. Uh, lots of spinning around. So yeah, that's one gotcha. And the other one is this concept of the world origin here, okay? So whenever you start your session, that's what the world origin is. So if you start it up here, that's the world origin. If you start it down here, that's the world origin. And that becomes zero, zero, zero for your coordinate system. Now, if you put a two meter wide sphere and you don't into the scene and you don't explicitly set its position, it will put it at the world origin, which is where you're standing you won't be able to see it because you're technically inside it. You'll actually have to move back to see this massive sphere. So that's another gotcha. Don't try not to put things at the, at the world origin all the time. So otherwise you just have to keep moving back to see it and don't put it, yourself inside massive spheres. It's good advice. Okay, so then we move on to what I like to think of as the, the building blocks of scene kit and these augmented reality experiences, these scene nodes. And I like to think of them as Lego bricks because they can, you can give them different colors, um, different sizes and different properties, and they can do different things, I guess. And then you join them all together to make something more interesting. You know, one Lego brick by itself is not very interesting, but you, you put them all together and it makes something a bit more interesting. Now, so these scene nodes, 
when we set we set the geometry, which is the shape uh, of the node, and we set the material of it. In fact, we set the material of the geometry, not the node, but in essence, we're setting the material of the, of the node. And that's the visual appearance of the nodes. That could be the color. So this at this point, we've got the shape of the node and the color or appearance of the node. And then we can also apply physics on those nodes. So we can say, well, this node, we I want this node to be have a rigid skeleton, and I'll, or I want this node to be obey the laws of physics. I just want gravity to pull it down. So we, we can do that as well. I've got an example of the physics uh, later on. Oh, and also my notes reminded me, nodes can have child nodes. So you might think, well, why would you want to add child nodes to a node? Well, if you think about it, if I put a, a wall of 100 cubes in a scene, then if I thought, actually, I want to move them further away, then I'd have to increase the minus Z property of 100 nodes. Whereas if I had add one node to the scene and added all those other nodes as child nodes of that node, I would just have to move the parent node and all the other nodes would, would move. So that's my why you might want to use uh, this, this ch child node concept. Okay, so again, I did have a code sample that just showed put a simple node or a cube or a sphere into the scene. Um, but I kind of do that in a later code sample anyway. So I'm going to skip over that and I'll, I'll just remember to, to point that out in that code. And hopefully this, this talk won't take as long as it did previously. Um, Okay, so geometries. These are the shapes of the nodes, if you remember. So from left to right, so these are the built-in geometries we can make use of. You can also create your own and import 3D models, but these are the, the base ones we can use. So, so from left to right, we've got box. Notice that's not a cube, it's a box, because we can have the height very flat and have it very long and very deep and make it more look like an Amazon package. Um, so that's why it's a box and not a cube. Uh, capsule, cone, cylinder, plane. Now I, can, I use these planes a lot in my experience uh, in, in my AR work examples. Uh, pyramid, which I've never had to use. Sphere, which are cool. This donut shape here is a torus. And then we've got a tube, yeah, a tube there. And then the one I always forget, which is hiding in plain sight is this one here, which is scene text which I generally never use because it's quite tricky to play ball. What I generally use if I want text in a scene is I create an image and then I use a, a 2D drawing package to, to add the text to the image and put the image in the scene. That's how fiddly and awful those scene texts are, so I don't tend to use them. So that's, um, that's geometries. Okay, I will jump into a code sample here of showing the built-in geometries because this will, in this one, I'll talk about the session running and the than placing of the nodes as well. So we'll kill technically three birds with one stone. I got it? No, I've not got a video for that. Videos come later. Geometry, I don't remember to include that in the project or I won't get IntelliSense in nice colors. Right, okay, so what I've done is when I've created this single app project, I get this, I had an empty view controller and what I've added to it are the, the bare, Bones I need to get these augmented reality sessions and scenes running. We talked about this little private read-only class called AR Scene View and how important that is. So in the controller, I'm instantiating it here. And uh, what I can do is set a couple of debug options or debug flags, which you would never set in production, but they're quite handy if you're starting off and trying to learn this sort of things. So I'm showing, I can I can set show feature points and what that will do is it will put little yellow dots on the surfaces that it detects. And if you've not got many yellow dots, that means you've probably, probably got bad lighting conditions. It can't pick out many interesting things in the scene. Um, or, and the second one is the show world origin. What that does is it puts an X, Y, Z fake um, floating axis at the world origin. And then it's got two purposes, I suppose. A is to mark the world origin and B is to show you which way X, Y, Z is in the scene. Uh, I actually show you that in one of the videos later. Then in this, this is where my knowledge of Xamarin and iOS development is, is uh, lacks a little. So I just end up just reading what the code is. So it's sitting here that the, the, this view is adding a sub view, which is this scene view here. I'm just reading the code here at this point. 
Uh, and then in the view did load events, I'm setting the scene view frame to be this views frame. Apparently. Uh, and then where the magic starts to happen is when the session of the scene view starts to run. And as I mentioned, I think I mentioned, when you run these sessions, you need to pass in a type of AR configuration. And the, the basic bog standard one that you want to use if you want any sort of AR capabilities is this AR well tracking configuration. We'll try other configurations later on. So here I've got a bit of a reminder that, uh, and you notice in, in a few of my examples that most of the top code is all the same. And the main thing that I'm changing is the point straight after the session starts running. Okay, so here I've got a bit of a reminder of the, the sizing system. So I'm saying uh, take a variable which is effectively five centimeters, create a material which is effectively just a color red. And this contents property is really interesting on this material because it can be a few things. It could be a color, an image, another scene. It's a few things it can be. It's, it, that's a magic property. Then what I'm doing is creating a new scene node, which I'm calling box node. I'm setting the geometry of the box node to be a box. As you see here, scene box create. Passing it in some variables, which is the X, Y, sorry, the width, depth, and length of the box. And then this last variable here is the chamfer radius. And that's just how, how curved, what's the sort of corner radius of this cube? Is it going to be a very sharp cube? Or is it going to be a bit of a rounded cube, more like a dice? Uh, I'm setting it to zero here, so it's going to be a very jagged, sharp cube. Uh, then I'm setting the materials for that geometry to be the material I created here, which is red. And I'm setting the position to, to be, we use this scene vector here to set X, Y, Z position in a scene. So I'm setting its position to be zero, which that's kind of redundant because it would have been zero anyway. And then I, I go off and, and I do the same thing for sphere and the torus and the tube. And you can see these have got different parameters to, to pass the, that method. Uh, I think the sphere is just the radius and I'm just making them all red and moving them slightly in the X, to, X axis so they're 10 centimeters apart, all these. And then I'm adding those nodes to as a child node of the root node of the scene of the scene view. It works. Uh, and then I've got some other bog standard stuff that's going off down here. And when the view did disappear, it's called calling session pause. So that's actually not a lot of code, if I'm honest, is it really? But let, let, let's be honest, and I'm sure this code isn't written to win any awards, by the way, to win any awards. It's not going to win any clean code awards. Uh, it's got to win. It's not going to win any performance awards. It's written for um, clarity and being able to explain it. So if you've seen repeating code, it's it's not on purpose. It's uh, I'm not saying I'd release it to production like this. It's just written for explanation purposes. OK, so that's your basic. Um, that will, if you run that, you'll get an augmented reality experience and you've got loads of floating shapes in front of your face, which doesn't sound impressive, but we're not going to get, we're going to get onto some more interesting things in a bit. So that's geometries, animations. Now animations, I call them animations. Technically, the scene actions, it just so happens that you can use them to animate things. So I was referring to this animations. There's a few things you can animate. You can animate opacity, so you can give something zero opacities yeah so you can't see it at all and then you can fade it in over a period of time to give it set its opacity to 100 percent. so it's just going to fade in and conversely you can sort of fade it out you can animate the scale so you can make something very start very small and, and grow or shrink uh you're sensing a theme uh okay and then you can animate the location so you can say I don't care what your position is currently, node, but I want you to move to position X, Y, Z uh, over a period of 10 seconds. It will animate the, the moving from one position to another. And you can animate the rotation as well. So you can say, rotate in one of the axes uh, over a period of uh, 300 and X number of degrees over a period of, of Y seconds. Uh, you can also wait. And you might think, well, why would you want to wait? It's because you can um, group or sequence animations. So you can group them simultaneously. So they fire simultaneously. So you might say, I want something to be invisible and small, but 
I wanted it to fade in and grow at the same time. So that you would use, group those two actions uh, and run them simultaneously, that would be a group. Or you can do them one after another. So you might say, okay, I want you to fade in. And then once you finish fading in, then I want you to move. And that's why you might want to wait. You might say, move over here, wait a second, move over there, wait a second, move back over here. You can join these up. Uh, you can create custom animations, which I've never done. And you can repeat these animations or actions to either repeat once or X number of times or over and over and over again, uh, repeatedly. Yeah. And you can use easing. So by that, I mean, you might not want the actions or animations applied consistently. And the best way I can explain this is if you're in a car and you want to go 50 miles an hour, you don't just go from zero to 50 like that because you'll probably get whiplash or your brain might hurt. Um, Conversely, if you're going 50 miles an hour, you don't want to get to zero immediately because you probably crashed uh, and you probably hurt yourself. So what easing, and then in, if you want to get 50 miles an hour, you kind of have it at a period of acceleration. So you start with zero miles an hour acceleration to, before you get to 50. So this is what this easing is. It might be that you, you don't want to move from here to here consistently. You might want to be slow, speed up, and then slow down again. That's easing. Okay, so time for another video. So in this video, pretty sure you can see this, and I hope it's really smooth and not, it is smooth when I, on my screen, but hopefully over um, Zoom, it's not the frame rates uh, but okay as well. So what I've done here is I've got a sphere. I've applied as the material, just a 2D image uh, with I think 95% opacity, so 5% transparency. And I'm saying just rotate on one of these axes, it axes 360 degrees of a period of 10 seconds. And that, that's all that is. And you see, I'm able to move around it because, and ARKit will maintain its position in that scene. In fact, I'm not moving around it a great deal. So that's that one. Uh, then I've got another video that shows how you can combine these animations. So what I'm doing is here is I'm, I'm moving them, I'm fading them in and I'm moving their Z index towards me at the same time. And that's that's how you can is it group yeah group animations and here when I touch these on the screen if I happen to touch one of these these two D planes it kind of animates the Z index again and changes the color of the, of the material. Okay, so I will show you the rotation. Well, actually, I'll show you the rotation code quickly, very quickly. Animate world. Okay, so this is all uh, stuff that we've seen before, pretty much. And then what I'm doing is I'm creating this, this sphere node, uh, which is a custom class I've created, which inherits from scene node. Uh, I'm, and then I'm adding it to the scene. I'm set, passing the size of one F, which is a meter, if you remember. Setting its pass to be to ninety to be ninety ninety percent ninety nine percent, and I'm creating its geometry. And in the geometry, I'm again doing this material, and this time I'm, I'm setting this, this magical contents, the, the property of the material to be an image. And I'm setting double sided is true. Now, this is another gotcha, which is really interesting, mind boggling. If you've got a 2D plane and you put it in the scene like this, if you set this side to have an image or a color, and you look at it from this side, you'll be able to see it. Now, if, if you look at it from this side, you won't be able to see it. It's really weird. You won't be able to see anything. It will just be if it's not there. Look at it from this side, you see a red plane. Look at this side, it's as if nothing's there. It's, it's a bit weird. Uh, so if you want red on both sides, you have to set um, this double-sided equals true. So I tend to do that with everything now. That's another gotcha, because you end up looking at pl nodes, uh, planes from the wrong side, and you can't see them. Uh, okay, so that's the sphere node I'm creating. Then I'm creating this, this rotate action here, and that's effectively the axis that I want to, something like X, Y, Z, so I mean the Y axis, I want to effectively, that's effectively saying rotate it 360 degrees. I think it might work in radians, I'm not sure, uh, of a period of 10 seconds. And then I want it to be a repeat forever action, 
So create me a repeat forever action, this rotate action, and then apply that action onto the, the node and then add the node as the child node. That gets returned and then I've got a rotating world and you can create your own world and you can make it huge or tiny, um, depending on how big your God complex is. And you can destroy it if you want, or you can be a benevolent God, create little people to live on it. I didn't mean to close that, I got distracted. Okay, so yes, that is animations. Animations are really good. Let's put it in the wrong virtual desktop, sorry. Animations are really good for uh, giving a bit of interactivity uh, in, in your uh, augmented reality experiences. Bit of movement is good. Okay, video and sound. It's quite simple to add sound. You just package up your MP3 file with, the, with your app and then you load uh, something like an NS audio player, I think, and then you, you hit call the play method. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, it's less so with video. To get video playing in a scene, like an MP4 video or something, you have to create uh, a, a new scene. The 2D plane creates scene within that 2D plane, set is the material of that. It's, it's, really, it's really messy. And I end up speak, taking ages showing the code for it. So it's, it's, I'll just show you the video later on, to be honest. Uh, so that you can add video and sound to your to your um, experiences, and I'll show you that as well. But I'm going to skip past the code because it doesn't really add much to your understanding of these concepts. Plane detection is interesting. It's not planes in the sky. It's it's two D planes like surfaces. So it's uh, desks, it's, it's floors, it's walls, it's it's anything that's flat basically. So we can set, turn on plane detection, and whenever it detects a horizontal or vertical plane, we can, it automatically raises an event and we can hook into that event. And uh, if it detects that the the, um, the plane that originally detected is actually bigger or smaller, then it, it fires another event, we can hook into that as well. Uh, as we move the camera around, it's constantly updating its understanding of the scenes, which makes sense because if you start the session, um, it's obviously just looking at the world from one angle, as you move around, it can actually work out a bit more information about that scene, just like we could you know, with our uh, vision. And it creates these AR plane anchors when we detect it. Uh, okay. So let's look at the plane detection video. And it was a couple of other things that uh, you might notice in this video. If you see any little floating yellow dots or yellow dots on surfaces, that's these feature points debug flag that we turned on. I've also turned on the, the show world origin uh, de debug flag, so you'll see that as well. Uh, da, da, da. So this is just my study at home. It's, it's really poorly lit. It, you can't tell from this video, it's really poorly lit, so it struggles. So there's lots of features. You can detect a plane, and you'll see there that I've got a poster on the wall and it's detected features in that so it's, um, poster so it can work out there's a plane there. It struggles to detect this very featureless uh, white wall here. Uh, and as, as I move around, I can see a lot more yellow dots. I move it to the floor. Uh, what I'm doing is I said, if you detect a, a horizontal plane, drop in a blue semi-transparent plane. If you detect a vertical one, use a red one. And as I move around, uh, there's that the world origin float around. I might have just missed it there. Uh, so move around. Uh, it eventually finds all the surfaces in the room. If it was a much better lit room, it would detect them a lot easier. Okay, so that is is plain detection. Uh, da, da. Do you want to look at the code for that? Let's. Now I've got a lot to go through. Let's skip the code for that one. Image detection. This is another uh, interesting use case. Oh, just before I skip back onto this one. So you might think, well, what's the point in being able to detect surfaces? It's a good question. Um, so there's a couple of reasons. So people have already built business businesses and business models around this. So you can detect walls and you could uh, try what different wallpaper or what different paints look like on the walls or different posters um, You can, or floors. You can also, if it's good to detect surfaces, because you might want to put a plane there to put other objects on in future. Okay, so that's why you might want to detect these, these uh, planes. 
So image detection is, is also a lot of fun. So what you can do is you can package up to 100 different images along with your app or tell it to identify 100 different images. Um, so for example, if you could take the face image of each deck, each card of a deck of cards, you've got 52 images. And if it detects one of them cards in the scene, you'll find this, this event. I don't know why you'd want to do that. As so you can bundle these images along with the app, or you can dynamically add images to detect. And that you might think that's a lot more useful. In fact, you might think, well, why would you want to do that? So for example, you could go off to the Amazon API, go get the list of 100 best selling books, get the images for the front covers of those books that you can see where this is going, um, store them in memories, memory and say, if you detect any of these front covers of these best selling books via this event, and then what we can do is we, we, could, we could do other stuff when it's detected, um, I don't know, 50 Shades Grey, which was the best seller last year, the year before, and they might pull in the, the reviews. Uh, you could go, go and call the Amazon API again and get the reviews for that book. So you could start to see where this image detection could be quite useful. And I've got three videos for image detection and I probably will duck into the code after I've played these videos. Right. So here, what I'm doing is I'm uploading, I package along with my app, uh, an image of my business card. And it's when it detects that in the scene, I'm getting it just to fade in. I'm, I'm, I'm placing uh, one, two, three, four, six other images into that scene at the, at the location it's detected the image uh, just by sending X, X and Y coordinates. And I've just told them, given a passy of zero and, and fading them in. And then when that detected image is manipulated that it detects, it will automatically uh, move the, the other images you placed uh, next to it. It's quite useful. And I talked about text earlier. This software, don't, and this, this text here, that's just a transparent PNG. And the transparent PNGs work really well with, uh, with this sort of stuff. That's quite cool. And you could do other stuff with that. Uh, I could make it so if I touched the, the Twitter button, they did something else, like maybe like a tweet Twitter panel came up, or if I clicked the LinkedIn, it showed a bit more about my LinkedIn profile, or if I click the YouTube, it'll play a video. So this, you have to use your imagination sometimes and think that's great, but how, how useful is that? You could extend these things, okay? It's, these things are gonna be as amazing as what you, your imaginations can make them. Next, here I'm detecting the same again, same image, but this time I'm placing a 3D model on top of the detected image. And then when I'm manipulating the orientation of that detected image, the, the orientation of the 3D model automatically moves as well. I don't have to do any clever maths. I'm just placing it on the, the, the two detected 2D image and it will just uh, change its orientation accordingly. So that's 3D models. And then the last one, I can play a video on the detected image. This time I'm using the reverse of my business card. And so if you detect that, play an MP4 video at the location that you've detected that, and it'll automatically uh, orientate the, the video depending on how I'm changed the orientation of that business card. Okay, it's actually playing music through my headphones. I don't believe you can hear that, but it's not actually important what I say. So that's there you go. So those are three ways that you can um, detect images. Sorry, use image detection. And I am going to look at the code really quickly because we talk about anchors in there. But I'm going to I'm going to do one example. So don't worry. Uh, so this is all box standard stuff. Uh, what we're using this time. I'm just going to scroll the text in because I'm just conscious that it might be a bit on the small side for you guys. Sorry, for you people. Um, so what I'm doing here, I'm using a delegate, I'm creating a class down below, and I'm saying when these events fire, when you detect these images and packaging up, then fire the event in this class, and I'll explain. In this view did appear method, I'm getting the de detection images that I want it to detect. In this case, there's only one, it's an image of my business card. Then I'm setting uh, I don't actually need play detection on it, I don't think. I could actually disable that, I think. Um, so the detection images to be this, this de 
collection of, of one image. Uh, I can set the maximum number of images to be tracked here, I'll set it to one. Then in this, this class that's handling the, the events, I'm saying I've got two events that I'm really interested in. This did add node and this, uh, da, da, da. oh, in this case, it's just the did add node. Uh, so what that does is I think is when it detects this, it drops in this anchor at the position it's detecting image. And then it is also creating this, an empty kind of node. And what we're doing is we're checking that the, the anchor that it's found is an image anchor, which it is. I do, I could actually get more details about the detected image, like maybe like the book ISBN or something, but I'm not doing anything with this variable here. Uh, and then all I'm doing is I'm creating a new image plane or a plane with an image in at a particular location relative to the card, a particular size, and I'm just doing that seven times. Uh, da, 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 create, so I'm getting an image. I'm setting the image to be uh, the material content, the content of the material, double-sided true, creating this plane geometry, which is just a 2D flat geometry shape. Set the materials of that to be the, the image. This is, you might be wondering what this is. Now by default, when you've got detected a 2D image, uh, a 2D plane like this, and you add another 2D plane to it, it does it at right angles like that, don't ask me why. So you have to rotate it by 90 degrees to make it flat, so, so it's parallel. So that's what this is. And I'm setting its position and I'm setting its opacity to start at zero. And then I'm saying fade in to 100% over a second. And that's what I'm doing. And that's, I'm doing that seven times. And that is what's making that uh, business card with the extra images uh, possible. So not, again, not a lot of code. I don't think anyway. Um, so we did that. I showed them face tracking. Now face tracking is a lot of fun. And um, one that I probably not had enough fun with. Not, I kind of discovered face tracking, was amazed by it and then moved on something really quickly. I need to go back to face tracking and have a bit more fun with it. So you can track up to three faces in a single scene. Uh, bear in mind, this is tracking, not identification or recognition. So this is detecting that there's three faces in the scene. It's not able to say, this is my mum, this is my daughter. Uh, there's a lot of negative um, stuff in the press about image facial recognition. So I just want to say that off the bat, this isn't what this isn't what this is. This is just that there's a face in the scene. Uh, this uses face tracking configuration this time. And when it detects a face, it places an AR face anchor at the location it's detected. And we can do things to that geometry. Uh, so I remember when I when I uh, first got this work and it freaked me out because it I looked like a scary mime. Um, so yes, let's, oh yes, video, let's look at the video. So it, it, the, it's already give me, gives me a geometry of the face. I don't need to do anything clever with that. All I've done here is just set it by default. It must be white because all I've done is set the opacity to be 90 or 80%. And if you can lip read, that's me saying it's working now. And you can see it's, it's that if it detects a face in the scene, it, it puts uh, this geometry on. And if it, if it goes away, uh, it takes it off. And you might think again, what's the point in that? How useful is it? Well, once again, start using your imagination. How do you think detecting, um, being able to put glasses on your face uh, works? And um, that's exactly what this is. It's detecting the face and it's just loading a 3D um, model, which is the glasses in this case, and it's positioning it around the eyes that it's detecting. So again, might look silly, but this allows this, this face wearing. So, um, so again, you could, you could extend this. You could, you could build a, a face tattoo app, couldn't you? So you could try different facial tattoos on. Um, that's, that's facial tracking. Uh, and the face tracking configuration uses the front camera by by, um, by default as well. So you could do things like, you could do other things, but it's, I don't know how useful it is. You could detect two faces in the scene. You could get the image of the faces and you can swap them around. Again, I'm not sure how useful that is, but um, you could do that if you wanted or try and try and hats or stuff like that. Okay. Uh, da, da. I won't look at the code for that. Um, I might look for the code for this one. So that's face tracking. 
Then I found out you can track facial expressions, which is amazing because I'm not just talking about smiling or blinking. Let's get rid of my pen. I'm going to quickly boot up this web page because this has got the whole list of the um, the faces. Sorry, the the expressions it can detect. And if it occurs to load up, and I realise I need to drag it up here. I'm just here we go. It can detect things like let me just zoom in. I blink left. Obviously, you need to be able to detect what one eye is doing, what the other is doing. <clears throat> Uh, eyes squinting, eyes wide. Um, uh, you can have a lot of fun trying to contort your face to get these events to fire. I don't know what mouth dimple left is up. Um, mouth shrug upper. I've, yeah, I've yet been able to unable to contort my face to fire these events. But it's, uh, I had a lot of fun trying. Right, I'll show you the demo for this. You'll notice instead of a the solid geometry. I'm using a, a mesh line effect for this one, so I look more like Hellraiser than a scary mime. Yes, uh, the video. So in this video, what I'm doing is I'm detecting different facial expressions. Smile, mouth down, eyes wide, eyes squint, mouth funnel, tongue out, cheek puff, eyes wide again frown and then I'm changing the color of the mesh depending on what it's detected um, which is kind of neat I will quickly show you the code for that I'm going to say quickly I mean quickly okay super large code again we've got this um, scene view delicate that's handling the the uh, events. This time I'm using an AR, fa uh, AR face tracking configuration. I'm saying maximum number of track faces is one. And then did add node. So it's detected a face. I'm checking if it's a face anchor. I'm getting the, the facial, the geometry that it, I'm creating a face, creating a geometry based on the anchor that's found. Then I am um, Ah, uh, yes. So then I'm, I'm setting the geometry of the node to the face geometry it's found, and I'm, I'm, making, I'm setting it to be fill lines. Then on no did update, which seems to have be firing quite a lot, I'm, what I'm saying is, if the expression threshold is over 50%, so if I'm only sort of squinting like 10%, I'm not that bothered, but if I'm smiling 50% or frowning 50%, then I probably want, I'm trying to frown or smile. So I'm saying here, if eyes wide left is greater than the expression threshold, then change face color to be green. Uh, I've quick look at that method. All I'm doing is, is setting material to be the, the color that I'm passing in. The fill mode, fill mode to be lines this time, and then setting material of that face geometry to be that. And that is how I get that sort of Hellraiser facial expression um, effect. A sentence I pictured myself ever saying. Okay, so that is facial expression tracking. So what you can also do is um, put 3D models into the scene. We talked about these basic primitive geometries. You know, the world's not full of spheres and cubes. Sometimes it looks a lot cooler, like these cars. So you can, the, the 3D models it uh, supports, I think, a DAE, which I think a collider, a OBJ, and scene which I think are scene kits uh, native formats. So you can get 3D models um, from places like free3d.com or, or sketchfab.com and, and import them into the scene or you can draw your own um, which I've tried doing in this next video which I'm not an artist I'm not like Ian um, I'd love to be an artist because I, I also want to learn how to use Blender because Blender is like a 3D modeling tool and it's really, really powerful. It's also really, really free. So it doesn't cost anything. Um, but I think if I'm able to create these 3D structures that I can bring them in my scene and um, uh, make my experiences even better. So let's look at a quick video for this. We are nearing the end of this, don't worry. Okay, so here what I'm doing, I, for this concept, I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if you could create a um, virtual, sorry, augmented reality, uh, da, 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 fantasy football team, 
or formation and um, go to your mates in the pub, like you do, and um, stuff share right, and then kind of show them on like the pub table that you are, oh, no, no, this formation would be better. Cantona or I don't know, some player that's probably still playing um, would be better at this position and you could you could have a bit of banter around that. And I think pubs have changed. Um, Okay, yeah, I have no football team affiliation as well. So if you're a red team, you can you can stop sort of cheering now, please. Uh, or if you're booing, it might be maybe you support Man City and you think I'm a Man United supporter. I, I trust you, I'm not. Uh, so that is, so you, can, you can, those ones are created in Blender and, and you can place them into the scene. I'm probably going to skip over the, the code for that because it's getting on a bit. Uh, I can't, the code is available on a website I'm going to show you later. Okay, so now we're moving on to UI gestures. So it's all well and good placing 3D objects uh, into the scene. It's not that much good unless we can interact with them. So what we're doing is iOS already has a concept of UI gestures on the device. So pinch and unpinch, which is the word for that apparently. Uh, so pinch, unpinch, uh, rotate, uh, pan, and like swipe. So we can detect these features on the screen and what we can do is we can um, see if they were touching something when you began that, uh, that, that gesture and then translate that into 3D space on, on, in, the, in the background. Uh, so yes, I'll show you the video in which we are doing that. I'll show you the boring one first and then I will show you the, the not so boring one. So in this, see, in this experience, all I'm doing is adding a cylinder box and pyramid I said it in news periods, didn't I? Um, to the scene, and then I'm pinching to do the scaling on the, and then I can I can do the rotate, and then I can do scale a bit more, and then I can I can sort of move and do this pan movement as well. So that's that's how you move random colorful shapes in space. But if you want to do something a bit more interesting, you could do something like this. Where I've just detected a two D plane. We talked about plane detection. Added some images to the surface and I'm using the pan gesture on each of the images so I can move them around. The rotate gesture to, to sort of rotate them if I want and then again a pinch to increase the scaling them. And again you can you have to use your imagination as to what could this be used for? Well maybe if you're looking at houses to buy these could be images. These could be images of house with house prices and details and you could be like a Oh, that's my pile for not interested. That's my maybe pile, and that's my definitely not pile. And then you could bring an image to the front and make it bigger, and then double click it to maybe you could bring it to not be 2D, but like 3D and have their images sort of fade in and pop around it of the interior. So you just got to use your imagination a bit. Uh, we are limited only by our imagination in this case. And this is why I quite like augmented reality. It is really a blank canvas for imagination and creativity. So lighting, it turns out, is quite important when it comes to understanding the world around us. As our eyes use light and shadows to, to understand depth. Uh, so if you are in bed and you wake up in the middle of the night and it's pitch black and you reach over to get your, your glass of water, chances are there's not enough light in there for your brain to figure out how far it is and you're gonna knock it over. I've done that, I bet everyone has here as well. So we wanna make sure that um, there's enough light in, in these environments because these, these, these experiences need light as well, a lot. And also, if you have a very light um, environment and you place a very dark object in there, and it's obvious that the sunlight's not affecting it, it's going to look weird. Conversely, if you've got quite a dark scene and you place an object in there and it looks really bright, it's going to look weird as well. So just got to bear in mind of the, the lighting uh, when you create these experiences. You can do that using something called a scene light. So we'll talk about that next. Uh, you can cast shadows so that you can uh, have a light on one side of an object and then have a sh shadow cast on the other side of it because it's sort of in, in between the light and the surface, excuse me. You can also detect uh, the changing uh, real world lighting. So um, if you want, four different lighting types and I struggle to explain what these are so I'm not going to go to too much depth. Ambient is next to useless because what that does is it says have a uniform light coming in all directions. 
therefore there's no shadows. So I don't know how useful that is. Directional lighting is, is one that uh, is quite useful because you can say shine a light in a particular direction. Uh, Omni is like directional, I think, except I think that's better for dynamic, if you want to make your lighting more dynamic. And then spot is a bit more obvious because you've kind of got like a, a spotlight, like a cone of light coming down on an object from an angle and then kind of the, the light falls off, off as the outside of the, the cone of light. Okay, lighting demo. I don't have many more of these videos. Right, okay, so here I've got a cube that I'm placing a few centimeters above the ground. What I've had to do is detect, I turn on 2D detection, sorry, plane detection, and it's added a 2D plane on the ground. Otherwise, if you think about it, what's, what's the shadow gonna fall on? Um, and that 2D plane at the, on the ground is completely transparent, except I'm saying, allow shadows to be cast on it. Then I'm placing a, a light, a directional light above this cube and shining it completely straight down. And then what it's doing, it's, it's casting the shadow onto this, this plane. Um, yeah, and I'm also turning on something called physically based rendering, I think on this cube's material, and I'm sending its metalness up to be max, and its roughness, roughness up to be really, really low, and it almost looks sort of, it is kind of reflecting uh, the, the light and the colors around it. It's great, it's quite cool. So that is lighting and shadows. I need to add more lighting and shadows to a lot more of my, my experiences, because it kind of looks weird if you've got something on a very bright sunny day outside, but it's not casting a shadow underneath it. It's incongruent. Right, physics is interesting. I think I'm getting really close to the end, guys. Just bear with me, uh, everyone, sorry. Um, I said you could apply physics to objects. So what we can do is we can, for these nodes, we can say, give it a physics body that makes it solid so that other objects can bounce into it rather than pass through it, which it would by default. We can also say this node is affected by gravity. So always pull it straight down towards the center of the earth. I don't know why they couldn't just call these methods make solid or give gravity or something like that. I don't know why the court chose and create kinematic body, create dynamic body, but hey ho. You can also apply force. So what I want to do is um, I want to create like a, a wall of cubes and then I want to create like a, a faint cannon and give like a cannonball some mass and then fire, give it some force in the direction of the wall and then see this, see all the, the bricks sort of tumble. I want to try that experiment next. Uh, you can also give objects friction. So I guess if it's touching another surface, it's going to get um, resistance, I guess. I'll try that. So then I've got my physics demo. So I have got a 2D plane, which I'm placing on my dining room table. Then I'm saying, calling it create kinematic body. So I'm saying make this solid. Uh, then I'm also, when I touch the plane, it's drop, creating a cube about 10 centimeters above the area I touched and dropping it onto this node. Uh, obviously these cubes I'm saying, give it, the physics body where it's affected by gravity. Um, so without them two things, the cubes wouldn't fall down, they'd just be where I pressed. And without the it's making this plane solidness solid, they would just drop straight through. And they do in, in some cases, I don't know what that's about. Uh, so that's physics. Okay, never knew physics was so easy. I know that we've got a physics fan watching this. You know, they might be doing this and go, what could I do? Okay, so I'm getting really near, and really near towards the end now, uh, people. So I just wanted to discuss some stuff we've not discussed because it's interesting and I take you to go away not knowing that it's in there, but it will be really brief. There's a thing called body occlusion. So by default, if I place a 2D cube uh, in front of my face and I pass my hand in front of my face, I don't actually see my hand. Um, I would always see the cube. If I turn on body occlusion, it will actually block it, the, the cube with, with my hand knowing it's there. So that's body occlusion. Session persistence, well, as your session's running, it's remembering all these interesting points. You can then save that session and then rehydrate it later on if you wanted. You can share sessions. So you could have, if I created an app and I was sharing this session and I had someone else who had the app running over there, we're both looking at the same surface and I place a cube on that surface, they'd be able to see it as well. That's my understanding of, of shared sessions. I've not tried that. 
object detection. So just like image detection detects a predefined 2D image, we can, we can turn our phones into scanning mode and then we can scan a 3D object like a cuddly toy, something like that, like from the generation game and save that map of points and then turn it to scanning mode. And then when I'm moving around the scene and it sees the same cuddly toy, it will fire that event because it's detected that object. So that's object detection. So body detection is if uh, my wife was stood over there and I, I did the camera in front of her, it would be able to detect her skeleton, not a real skeleton, obviously it's not X-ray, that'd be cool, but it's not. It's, it's that there's the head's here, there's the neck joints, the arms, it'd be able to detect the joints, it'd be able to detect um, arms, legs, limbs, the angles of these, these joints and stuff like that. So that's body detection. Constraints is an interesting one because you can tell nodes to one example is always point nodes at something else. And you think, well, my, why would you want to do that? Well, if you might have seen a, the, the photo, 3D photosphere that I created earlier uh, at the beginning, and that's just 2D planes. Uh, and all I've done is always face this invisible node in the middle. I've not had to work out the maths to work out the angles. I've said set a constraint so these 2D planes are always facing inside and that's uh, that's the um, constraint. Physically based rendering we touched on a little bit uh, and cameras which we didn't touch upon. Uh, so these three here aren't our kit but they are something I like to experiment with. So Vision Core ML is something in iOS where you can point it at Banana and it would say I've got uh, with an 80 degree 80% 80 confidence uh, that that's a banana. So I want to sort of try that with um, augmented reality, mix them together. Uh, geolocation, so I want to be able to create a massive penguin and put it in the middle of a field at a certain black long geo, uh, geo coordinates and then go to that field and see if it's there. Uh, and then real-time communication signal, I want to see if I can get uh, inside the app um, responding to events that have happened outside via, via uh, sockets and, and signal are. So that stuff not discussed. Okay, so all the stuff that's discussed today is on this website, samarinarkit.com that I created and um, with some lessons on, and I, I use the term lesson very, very loosely. It's mainly an, a description of my understanding of, of something, a video, uh, some code of, of how I've got uh, it working, and then a video of, of, of the effects that I've created. Uh, and the reason I've done that is that with our kit, you'll find lots and lots of swift and objective C samples, but not many C sharp or dot net samples because uh, I don't think many people know you can do this stuff in, in C sharp. So I'm trying to remedy that by, by creating these examples and getting them out there. And that's, that's that. That's Samurai our kit. So in summary, these are the kind of things we looked at. We looked at the, the business of, it, of augmented reality, we looked at nodes, geometries planes, materials, image detection, face tracking, uh, emote expressions, animations, lighting, physics, and a few other things. Uh, and hopefully I've shown that all you need is a Mac, um, Visual Studio for Mac and an, uh, an iOS device, and you can use C-sharp and .NET to, to create AR experiences. So you don't need an expensive headset like HoloLens. You don't need to learn Unity. Um, you can uh, just use AR kit, C-sharp and .NET and um, create these things. And in future, one of your future job titles might be AR developer, you, you never know. Uh, you watch this space. And then again, further information. This is the last slide to be pleased to hear. So this is a uh, website, examinearkit.com I mentioned. I blog at manchesterdeveloper.com. I'm at Twitter at the Engelston. Uh, and I'm working on a book in association with APRESS to, to put all this stuff together so that .NET developers can uh, create uh, augmented reality experiences on their iOS devices. And that is me done, Pete. Not exactly brief, but I'm finished, I promise. Yeah, I'm don't stop. need to worry. It's fascinating. I'm going to stop share. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Back to there you. Go. Yeah, yeah. That was really good. Thank you very much. Both talks were awesome. Um, and something um, different to the normal run of the mill talks that we get uh, dot net not. So no, it's great to see. Thanks both um, for those talks. Has anybody got any specific questions for Lee? Yeah, I've got a question. Go ahead. So um, this is my first time here, by the way. So thanks for the great two talks. They were both really interesting. Um, 
how is he how easy is it to like extend uh the features that ar has so for example at the moment it's got facial detection but say you wanted to detect hair or feet or things like that like for the shoe wear example for example like how easy would it be able to use features to do that so uh i i think the some of the exam similar examples that i've seen that you you, you talk about is I think the easiest way would probably to create use um, Core ML, which I've not done, but apparently that's like a framework within iOS as well, where you can create machine learning models. So if I, I imagine you could create enough, uh, if you had enough images of different, say you wanted to detect hairstyles, for example, yeah, I don't, yeah, <laughs> you wanted to detect hairstyles, then you'd, you'd um, it's quite a, a range just watching you people here with the, the hairstyles, but um, uh, you could have lots and lots of images of hairstyles and and uh, create a a model for core ML and then um, I, I don't know how whereabouts you would hook it in or if you would even use augmented reality for it so if, it depends if you're going to ever put anything in the scene I guess you might use augmented reality but if all you wanted to do was detect haircuts or hairstyles then I guess you wouldn't um, but I think it would it, you would use a combination of AR kit and core ML if that makes sense in that example mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not on mute anymore. Oh, we can hear you. <laughs> oh, I thought I'd turn my mic down saying that. <laughs> no. Clearly that's not a kill switch then. I turned the volume right down on the sound card. Did you hear my partner talking as well? No, no, just mm. you. <laughs> Use the software next time. Uh, Lee, mm -hmm. um, how many objects can you have... Um, in your field of vision at a time before it starts slowing down or performance starts degrading or is, is there an issue with that? It, it's a really good question. Um, and I wondered the same thing myself. So what I tried doing was um, I, I created little spheres, one, I think about one centimeters or 10 centimeters um, big. And I randomized X, Y, Z positions within I think 10 meters or a meter. And I yeah. said, every 100 milliseconds, add one of these in a random place. And I'd, I'd start it and it, I'd have a little counter going as well. And as I'd move around, it did handle quite a lot more nodes than I thought. Uh, so I placed these little orange spheres everywhere. And as you moved around, sure enough, you could see all these spheres that I was putting around. And eventually, it did slow down because it obviously the process is like having to maintain thousands of these little, little things in the positions. Um, I can't remember the exact number that I got up to, but I, I imagine it depends on a lot of things. So it might depend on what version of iPhone you're using. It might depend on um, a few things. So I can, I can, I can get the answer to you. I might even. No, have no, that, that's it. fine. I, I guess I was just asking, is it, can you do enough to do nice graphics or nice nice graphs and nice um, sort of detailed, um, not graphics, but I suppose you could overlay with pictures or and I'm not I'm not quite sure what I'm saying, but so I think I, I wondered this exactly the same thing. So it's it's not like like your polygons. You know, like when you create yeah. a three D graphics guys, it's not like not like polygons or um, is it polygons? Yeah. All them sprites and stuff. Sprites, yeah, yeah. So it, it's not, it's not on that scale. It's not millions of sprites. It's yeah. more like you probably wouldn't use it for that reason. But you can put thousands of objects in there, and I think it started slowing down when I got to about seven thousand. I think. Okay, um, that's a lot. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Silence. <laughs> that was really good. Um, I was saying in the chat that uh, AR is um, awesome, and I think it'd be awesome to have. Uh, I like history and stuff like that because I'm a proper geek. Uh, but when you go to some of these sites, there's nothing that much to see. Some of them are just like foundations of a building, and it'd be dead good to be able to take your phone out and and show that. And I know there's there's some applications that have been done in towns where you can you can walk up and see what the town used to look like 
uh, but nothing uh, major. It'd be great for for someone like English Heritage to to really invest in that, and it would make better use of some of the the less visible sites or even the more visible ones that you could you could overlay some information on that that would help people. So conservations are really uh, one of one of the first use um, industries of, that I found adopting it. So there's people using drones to fly around uh, archaeological sites and use photogrammetry, photogrammetry, which is taking thousands and thousands of pictures from different angles and then building a 3D model of that um, and using it for conserv conservation um, reasons so that if there was ever a, a bad storm and a wall fell down or um, people on the other side of the world started blowing ancient sites up for the fun of it, you know, these things happen, unfortunately. Um, and also I've seen what's happening is people like, I think it's the British Museum or a big natural history museum in America are scanning all these artifacts in 3D, um, which are just sitting in a drawer in a dusty room in a vault somewhere and you never see the light of day, but they're scanning these things and people are scanning works of art so that you can see these things in your living room rather than having to, 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 to go out and see them. Sounds good. Yeah, I know um, some of the, the Middle East monuments were destroyed, but they, um, I've seen work done where they compiled uh, tourist photos into models and used mm. those to reconstruct it, which sounds like science fiction, doesn't it, really? Uh, or something you'd see in a crime series yeah. or something. But. Yeah, it would have been a few years ago. It still gets me, though, when you go to these, these high-tech crime... Uh, crime um, dramas where they where they kind of they zoom in and you can see like the the enemy and like the reflection of someone's eye or something <laughs> or enhance a blurred image to make it crystal clear or something. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah there was some work done uh, on that recently that turned out really bad where i forget which company it was but they were de-blurring images weren't they they were taking pixelated faces and depixelating them only they took a pixelated face of Barack Obama and it depixelated him into a white guy, hmm. which sort of then you know comes back to to the, the cognitive bias and stuff that, that goes into those things. They did also do it for the Duke Nukem sprite from uh, the DOS game and made a real human out of it, which is quite disturbing looking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, quite good. Uh, not entirely related to what we're talking about, but yeah, it was interesting nonetheless. I really enjoyed the uh, the part with the business card where it was snapping on bits onto that. Uh, and I've seen other things not quite as good as that done before. That was that was quite a clever idea. It's quite a simple, easy use case to get you started, um, but it could be extended, like I say. So, I mean, before we get retinal, retinal implants that gives everybody AR, uh, there's a social impact for those glasses, obviously. Uh, the Google Glass uh, didn't go down particularly well from a social point of view, and I can't see, I can't see any going down particularly well. Even if they're really well-made Gucci glasses that you wouldn't even know, people know, don't they? Because you've got to have a camera somewhere on that for it to know the outside world to be able to project stuff. What, have you got any ideas about how it could become more socially acceptable? Was that a change we just got to wait for? I think people are slowly getting used to the fact that their civil liberties are, are degrading. And it, it's a fact and it's an unfortunate fact, but I think people are slowly getting used to the fact. Um, people are sort of shouting out about it. And it, we're getting into the realms of political uh, politics now and, and not sort of technology, but uh, they're going hand in hand sometimes, I suppose. Um, I don't know is the, is the answer, I guess. If, if someone was just walking around with a, a camera all the time recording things and you know sometimes when I'm out playing uh, with my kids and some of the families recording their family and I get in shot I, I don't get upset by that do you know what I mean so that's I could if I wanted to say you just record my image you know it's, it's a public space it's my fault but I still don't want you to have that image and it's just I guess extending that further isn't it but um, yeah I, I don't know yeah. They are contact lenses. <laughs> the, thing, the thing I think people, some people found really odd with the Google Glass, though, was the fact that you were talking to somebody and we rely a lot on eye contact. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're geeks, so we probably don't as much. But um, 
but like you were constantly people's attention was constantly being drawn away <laughs> to something that was like because if you had like your alerts and then yeah. new email pops up you'd be talking to somebody and their eyes would be constantly shifting away from you and that can be a really weird feeling i guess i bet oh. I quite yeah, like. Oh God, probably got its challenges. Yeah. I quite like the idea of it. If I was running though, to have uh, the ability to overlay stuff. I mean, obviously, if, maybe if you're going uh, somewhere, you need to overlay a route that on all of its own. But I don't know exactly the the thing you just mentioned there, Ian, about notifications popping up while you were running could be quite good actually. I'd quite like that level of connection. Anything mm -hmm. to distract me from the pain of running. <laughs> Yeah, I think people are just relying on technology. It's going to be a personal choice, isn't it? People are relying on technology to different degrees more and more. I, I went to Japan to visit my brother who lives there uh, last summer. And um, his his girlfriend at the time who, who lived there knows the way around. When we said, right, we, can we go to visit this place? She, she knows the way, but she's still got Google Maps out on her phone and was using that. And I thought that, that I found that a bit odd that she knows the way. Um, it's the same way, like, if, if you know where you're going, sometimes you put sat-nav on anyway, even though you, you know which destination you're going, because you might get a traffic update or some stuff like that. I don't know. I, I think just people rely more and more on technology, and it's definitely going that way, not not less and less. Yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, all on its own is going to become more socially acceptable, because we just, you know, you're going to fall behind if we don't use it. The, yeah, it's... I don't know if you ever taken the tube as well. Um, I try not to, but everyone, no one talks to each other on the tube. It's not allowed. You can't talk to each other on the tube. Everyone has to look at the phone. It's a lot. It's, it's just the law. You've got to look at your phone on the tube like this and not <laughs> look at anyone or talk or anyone. Yeah. Um, so is that social acceptable? No, it's rude. It's very rude. <laughs> um, but that's what people do. So you talk about sort of social acceptance, but it, it, yeah, I, even that's changed already. And sometimes it changes so slowly that we don't even know it's changing um, to the point where you, you yeah, you, you don't have, even make eye contact or talk to people on your commute. You could, people go on the commute and it might, might take them an hour to get to their office in London and they won't talk to a single person or look at a single other person in the eye. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's yeah. you find that about Londoners though. That's <laughs> all right, I've got nothing against <laughs> Southerners, by the um, way. I'm sure there's like, some nice ones. I'm from up, in, I'm from up Barnsley, so I know that like, you can't even get on a bus without somebody talking to you. Um, <laughs> it's because they know your mum. <laughs> probably. Um, but like, but yeah, I think, but also the way I tend to look at it, having commuted to London for two years, it's such a stressful experience that all you are thinking about is just getting to your destination. You're not thinking about any social contact. It's kind of, People just want to retreat into their own world for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, imagine you just want to go on an autopilot, don't you? Not think about it. Yeah, you don't. You tend not to go. You tend not to want to do that. But then, of course, we're British as well, which makes us more reserved. And you've got the how long a delay should you have before you can like make eye contact after about ten minutes delay and go. <sighs> <laughs> That's it. And then after about two or three of those, you t you're allowed to say typical. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I've got an Italian friend who like he was commuting into London and he's going I don't understand it like if this was Italy people would be breaking down the station master's door when things like this happen but you Brits like one old woman saw you was getting stressed so she got a thermos out and offered him a cup of tea um, so a cup of tea solves everything <laughs> now that is something that would be quite good not to do with augmented reality but just like drones that deliver tea <laughs> oh, it's some cases your background Ian yeah I tend to I tend to try and do a different background per meeting <laughs> but there's a theme Yes, I that tend to do. I, I tend to do it at work on on Microsoft Teams. Change the background and 
everyone thinks you've, you've got some sort of superpowers or, or some sort of elite hacker because you can change the background stage <laughs> on Teams. Adder, the Tiger King, I think. Nice. And uh, you... the Millennium Falcon one as well. Yeah, I mean, we've not quite got um, a game plane in the background. Of course, it doesn't look like it's a live game. Peter. Me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Although I've been alive for a good long time, so I must be really good at it. <laughs> yeah, that's been that's been on there for a good long time now. I mean, obviously, the, the common one that people have would be that one. Uh, but I did I did have that for a good good long time as well, which I thought was quite applicable right at the very start. <laughs> that or uh, you know that. <laughs> My favourite so far has been the um, the daily briefing background where you stand in the Prime Minister's <laughs> pot with the <laughs> scientists on either side of you, the flags. Perfect. <laughs> my daughter uses it as well, so I get Moana popping up in there. <laughs> and uh, Barnard Castle. Yes. Nice. <laughs> what does it say? Can't welcome, quite see. Uh, welcome to no, Barnard no. Castle. Oh, me. I'm going to have to take a drive to... Um... Oh, you are. Yeah. <laughs> Monday. Yeah, I like putting in random pictures of people in the meeting as my background to see what they say. <laughs> did you see that. the Did you see the guy who recorded a video of himself uh, <laughs> delivering a cup of coffee to himself? <laughs> uh, no. Coffee on the desk, and then partway through the meeting, like he's just got the empty room, and then the door opens, he walks in and puts a cup of coffee next to himself, and then he picks it up <laughs> and takes a drink. Hello, brilliant. Uh, 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 Scott Hanselman did something similar to that, didn't he? Where he was doing that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Quite good. I've heard of a friend's kid who um, recorded himself paying attention to the teacher, mm. then played it on the loop. Uh -huh. <laughs> Somebody, in fact, is it John in this meeting? His uh, image is him reading a book, which I had double take originally to see if he was just being really still reading a book during the whole meeting. <laughs> <laughs> He's been reading that a while. Yeah, yeah, that single page. <laughs> it's very good. I like that. There's somebody at work who's um, given us her secret for how to, like, um, if somebody asks an awkward question in a meeting, she just, um, she literally just kills Zoom. <laughs> like, and then, come, like, comes back about 10 minutes later and went, sorry, my internet went down. Um, <laughs> Yeah, what were you talking about? Oh, we've moved on since then. <laughs> <laughs> so now I know if she ever disappears in a meeting, I know exactly why. Yeah, <laughs> she didn't want to answer it. You just <laughs> ring her on the phone straight away. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody actually played with uh, AR other than uh, Lee? Hmm? I'd say with go on. It's still, it's still relatively new. Definitely not in Xamarin. No, I mean, uh, sort of any VR or AR stuff, I'd, uh, it'd be uh, Unity I'd be dropping into. And, and I did a tiny little VR app with a, a square, a cube in front of me that I could walk around. I just followed a tutorial for that. Uh, and I was able to get that to work on my Gear VR. Uh, and I was, yeah. I think anything harder than that was quite difficult. So I stopped at that point and just felt proud and left it. <laughs> Do you guys have any advice for starting C Sharp? Because I'm basically starting a job next week and I've never actually done much C Sharp before. So any advice on .NET or C Sharp or the whole ecosystem in general? Yeah, um, Microsoft recently, I think it was, uh, was it after build last year or this year? Uh, either way, they've released a whole series. Scott Hanselman and, and a few different people have created a whole series of getting started with, with C Sharp and their fantastic videos. Uh, where are you based out of interest? Um, so my job's in Cambridge. It's at Microsoft Research. But then ah, cool. we're working from home till like... October or November or maybe even next year who knows but yeah so I'm staying in Nottingham at my parents house at the moment oh okay so you've got the you've got so the, my uh, neck of the woods then yeah <laughs> eventually back in Cambridge yeah um 
might bump it, might bump into him at the, the, the bus stop, have a cup of tea. But um, there's the Microsoft Learn site, isn't there? That's relatively yep. new. Um, Rob Miles does a good series of books, I think, Introduction to, to C Sharp. Is it time yet for somebody to write C Sharp the good parts? Um, Are you offering? I've, I've seen too many people write books. <laughs> um, it seems a lot of stress. So I'm, 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 I'm quite impressed at anybody who tries writing books like you're doing, Lee. Yeah, that's, I was surprised. I was quite surprised when I reached out to them and said, I've got this idea for a book. And they went, yeah, okay. <laughs> You've got till November to write it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not ever, it's not something that is ever going to make you rich. Um, but it's, I, the way I'm approaching it is a way of, of learning ARKit as well. Like in order to really understand something and to write about it, we have to sort of learn it really, really well uh, and learn it to the point where I can easily describe it as well. So that's my thinking as well. It's that's, sometimes how I've used talks at conferences is to learn something. So this is. So this is all the videos that uh, that Scott has done. I think it was, it was last year. I mean, that's that's how time's flying. Um, I think it must have been after last year's build that we announced this. But uh, this is a fantastic place to get started with um, with everything from C sharp and dot net core and even IoT down here. Um, mm, I'll have a look so, at that. Yeah, and obviously this is coming from the horse's mouth, so uh, you know that this is going to be well curated and. Uh, and it's going to be good. I mean, on, onwards from that, then Plural Site is fantastic. Um, mm. You know, the quality is going to be high at Plural Site. Um, the downside with that is uh, that you most likely have to pay at some point. Um, yeah. But if you're a Microsoft employee, there's a chance you might even get a free Plural Site subscription. So mm. um, if not, then they, they're always giving away at least 14 days, if not 30 day free trials. Um, if you speak to any of the, the published authors of Pluralsight, I am a Pluralsight author, but I'm not published yet. I think they often get codes as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I know Stephen Haunts would be our local uh, Pluralsight author. So um, if you send him a message on Twitter and tell him I sent you, then I bet he would be able to give you a free code for you to get started with that as well. And there's all sorts on there. It's just primarily a, a .NET framework, but they are branching out to, to Amazon and all the rest of the platforms as well. So, um, yeah, and uh, you can watch YouTube if you like, but you just don't know what you're going to get. And that's the same with Udemy as well. You might be lucky, but you don't, yeah, if you're just starting you out. Pop luck. Yes, you want to make sure that you're going to start out with reasonably good code practices, and you might not get that from those two platforms. Mm. Um, so, so yeah. what languages do you know? That was literally what I was coming for, yeah. Um, so I've done Swift. I did a lot of Java last year on my internship. Um, yeah, mostly Swift and Java, and then C and C++, we do quite a bit of that uh, at uni. And then a bit of like the stranger ones like ML and Prolog and ones no one really uses in real life, pretty much. <laughs> it's not a huge jump from Java to C Sharp. I did that jump. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, you'll probably learn just by doing and from the people around you. Yeah. It's just going to be one of these things that takes a little bit of time. But if you've got other languages, like you know, it doesn't take long between different syntaxes. Mm -hmm. And it's not that much different to syntax between nah. C sharp and Java. It's Java just libraries. uses more words. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and changes a few changes in case for a few things. Yeah. It's the default standard, and um, the libraries are a bit different. Like, but apart from that. Yeah, it's fairly easy. Well, and it's a lot easier than it used to be. And I think, you know, C Sharp has embraced more the open source world now as well. So you even find a lot of similarities between some of the libraries that you'll use in Java and some of the libraries that you'll use in C Sharp work. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks for that. Yeah, I'll have a any look of them at those. begin with an N. Probably just yeah. ported over. <laughs> so N unit was J unit, um, but then they've then they've evolved a little bit because, like, 
C Sharp evolved more on the language features, whereas Java, like Java, more evolved the JVM. Mm. So things like Link seems to be better than um, Streams, is it? And a few things like that that make the difference and async awaits and all the good stuff. Those are the functional features, I don't know if they're in Java. There are some new ones now in Java 8, I think, but they're not that proliferated. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the code base that one of the code bases that I'm in charge of is ancient. I think .NET 1.1 was when it was started. So it's got every paradigm that has ever existed in the .NET world um, at some point. So, as we said, it evolves. <laughs> so it won't have generics in, will it? It's, yeah, even it's before still... generics. Yeah. It's, got, it's got some generics in, but other things are just using array list. Um, yeah. It just... Yes. Um, it just uses ev like a bit of everything is the way forward. And now that we've started working on it, because we brought the product in, um, we've started using more of the newer features as well. So it's now beautiful. It has evolved and become its own um, special organism. You're not combining array lists with the new features, are you? No, when, whenever we see them, we tend to convert things, but... Um, the 100% coverage on the unit tests, right, for that? When we, bought, when we actually bought it, the person turned up with a hard drive because he didn't have a repository. It was just a hard drive <laughs> with, the flat fi with the files on it. He never used source control to oh, gosh. make it in, like... I think it, that was 15 years old, the code base, and he never used source control. Um, you could tell what revision of what assemblies he was using because they had a number at the end of the directory name. So um, it was like, we've added tests now and we're adding tests as we write code. Um, but it all works exactly how it's coded to do. But then the other project that I've got is a year old that I'm working on. So the code is a lot different. Mm -hmm. You ever find that sort of people go out the way and if they've, they've made simple code too complex by adding too many layers? So many times. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry, but developers <laughs> freaking love abstraction. And no matter how much pain it causes, ah, yes. Um, number one offense for wanting to slap people. But I do it. But I then, yeah, yeah. I, I, I tend to now get to a point where I go, can somebody just come and look at this? Am I being stupid? Mm. Yeah. I, I think that's the thing with experience, though, right? You, it's that um, curve where you start off really simple, you get to a certain stage in your career and you over-architect every little bloody thing. And then you get back down to the other stage where you simplify everything and have to fix all your old code. Yeah. It's like a well-known thing within development. And yeah, I've seen, like I've done, I've seen people do effectively enterprise Hello World um, and mm. lots of dependency injection. You go, for God's sake, you're not like you're just trying to print Hello World on the screen. Um, I think there's the difference. Um, what's his name? Dan North once said that there's a big difference between familiarity and simplicity. Yeah. And Things seem simple when they're very familiar to you. So you've got into the habit of building everything that complicated. So it's a really simple thing. But then somebody new comes along and goes, what the hell am I supposed to do here? And yeah. And so that's really useful. As a new starter, I would recommend 
whenever you have a what the fuck moment going on, write it down and make a note of it and tell people um, because your sort of your surprise in what you see is something that none of your colleagues are actually going to be seeing anymore because they're too familiar with the system. So I know that Connell's probably seen some of the code from when I first started as a developer because of where he works. <laughs> I'll be very careful. Oh, no, about I think we've been doing well. <laughs> Ah, all right. <laughs> that time. Have you not no, printed it out? I, to I must have done it at some point. <laughs> I know I used to get um, comments because I could. We did a lot of autofac back then, and I kept spelling it autoface in like every single commit because I knew it annoyed <laughs> people. <laughs> not seen. No, we still do use autofac for everything, but yeah. Yeah, I did it just to annoy Adam Cox. I think he went through and like amended all of my old commits after I left. <laughs> oh, he just gave me a lecture on not rewriting history, so I'll, I'll <laughs> let him do that. <laughs> we had it, like, I think I worked on a code base at a different company where we ended up... Um, like everything that I, everything that now I thought should be quite specific, they tried to generify. And everything that I thought that should be generic, they'd made specific. It was kind of everything was the wrong way around. So when you wanted to do anything, you just couldn't because you'd have to like push um, anything that was like, I don't know, specific to, we were doing some integrations with Git. Anything that was specific to Git had been so generified that you didn't even know it was talking to Git. But then something that was like the core of the system, where you could work with a number of different objects, all of those were really specific and you couldn't, and highly convoluted. And what they did with interfaces, I still think is amazing. Like you found the reverse tree of interfaces. So you'd have an object that implemented what implemented what interface you go into that interface and that would implement, that would inherit from three others. And then you go into each of those and like mocking out one of those classes, there were 300 methods. So when, you say, when you said you found it amazing. Um, I mean, I just find, I don't know. I mean, I can, I can appreciate like, I can find like tsunamis amazing and also completely terrifying at the same time. Um, like, and not want them to happen. Um, so I, I can, like, the kind of beauty that's there in people over engineering things. Yeah, I'm sure it's, it's made with good intentions, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, everybody's done the thing that they thought was best at the time, but like the company, at, that, that company had taken a lot of juniors, taught them a load of stuff about how to do good software design and given them all the patterns. And then the entire code base just became patterns everywhere. Yeah, you need to know when to apply them. To be fair, you learn so much from over engineering things. Oh yeah. Everyone's got to do it at some point. That's why everyone has to break things as well. Sometimes I wonder like what other industries suffer from like the server engineering. I struggle sometimes to think what, what other industries would, would suffer in the same way that we do. Really hope probably surgery argue, isn't one of them. Probably argue more. There's like more physical industries are probably less able to iterate on top, like if you're building a bridge, you can't just build like a bit of a bridge and be like, well, ship that, like half a bridge with a big hole in it or something. So you have to kind of a bit more waterfall it, which may, may be more prone to over-engineering. Well, I know, like I've got friends who are trained as engineers and they will go, like you get a material that's got a certain amount of tolerances. And so they'll go, ah, 50% more than what we need. Yeah, that's fine. Um, because they're quite happy to take that kind of, they'd rather be safe than not when you're building a bridge. Mm. Um, but they have more standardized and more known standard components as well. 
Um, yeah. I think a lot of the engineering is, is not necessarily the code, but the overthinking as well, isn't it? Before you even put fingers to keyboard. And I would do things like, I don't know, is, is the HS2 a good example of that? Or is that just, just politics that's making that spiral out of control? Or is it people overthinking it or over engineering it? I don't know. What was the root cause of that problem? more you know about how to do things the worse that problem gets certainly I've, I've spoken to people who have had some time off and they've gone and done all the exams and read all the books and then they've come back and they've come into a shared base of code and decided it's all crap and they need to rewrite it all uh, to do the, all this special stuff that nobody else understands then at this point and that, that gets really yeah a little bit frustrating i think there's almost a code archaeology that you could do you can like look at a person's commits and go, ah, he went to that conference on that date <laughs> and learned that thing from that person. Um, um, and it's kind of at the moment at Redgate, there's a lot of talk about like Kubernetes and Docker and various things like that. And lots of people have been trained on what I think is technology. What we're not talking about is what we want to implement on it. And I think that if we talked about what we were doing first and stuck to and like taught really simple principles, I think how we deploy it is an issue when we need to deploy it into that environment. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't go, ah, we should use Kubernetes because it's cool. We should go, we have this problem. Kubernetes can solve this problem. Now we'll deploy into it. And I think sometimes as tech, we get the other way around. We get, here's cool tech. How can I invent a problem to make it useful? Yeah, hundred ten percent. I think people do that as well because if you're using using old tech, might solve your problem just as well. But if you're using new tech, you're also going to learn something as well. I think from a developer's point of view, personally, it's probably beneficial to them in some way. Yeah, there is a bit of moving with the times because I mean, part of the reason that big banks are stuck on COBOL on a mainframe is because they've never, they've not moved as time has moved on. And now they're stuck with this big legacy monster where they have graduate training programs where they just teach people COBOL because all the COBOL developers are retiring very rich after lots of contracting or, um, like dying um so like so there's there's a bit of finding the right time to move talking of being old i'm knackered <laughs> so i'm gonna leave you all to it because it's past my bedtime thank you very much jess really appreciate your help tonight no we, now, we now have a code of conduct on the website thanks jess so um and I promise not to ruin any more conferences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're written into the code of conduct now. She's just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're on the blacklist. Yeah. Um, thank you all for your Ian and the uh, leafy talks. It's been great and good discussion afterwards as well. But I am going to bed, so I'll see you all soon. Right, no Thanks, problem. Jess. See Appreciate it. See you later. See you later. Cheers. I mean, I this is why behind it, to be yeah. fair. Uh, this is why I like uh, this is why I like Lee's talk and things like that. I've got no plans at the moment for augmented reality, but just knowing some of the things exist mm -hmm. just means that I've got a jumping off point. Should I ever have that idea or it become useful? I don't know, I'm assuming whatever that, you, whatever oh, you on, do, do might be the next big thing. True. I, mean, I suppose that's how some innovation can come about. Somebody going to a talk and then bringing it back to work and going, hey, I saw this talk on this crazy idea that's completely unrelated related to what we do, but we could do this with it. And then who knows if you've got uh, like 10 or 20% time to experiment with that in your office. Yeah, you might make the next big thing for the company just out of a random spark of idea. Now I'm going to go make an AR loans thing somehow at my place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My, my employees have asked that because they know I've done these talks and they're, they're like, um, 
So, so when when are you going to do an augmented reality app for for our industry? We, we I'm in the car leasing industry, and I think they just assume that I'm one of the people that just wants to use new technologies. It's like I'm very much um, with with you, Ian. Like there has to be a reason for using that that technology. You know, it's like um, if you if all, if the only tool you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, isn't it? But the more tools you have in your toolbox, the, the more likely you're going to use the right tool. Uh, and the better, better plumber, mechanic you are, you're going to know which tool to use and which not to use. It's A little knowledge is very dangerous, isn't it? Show you the yeah. But a hammer works for everything. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, Lee, are you, are you kind of gearing up for a few years' time when glasses are more common and then you'll, you'll be in the space where you're like an advanced AR... I've got Damn. one eye on that. Yeah, that's another reason that I've sort of right in the book is like, ideally, and obviously you, you've got to hedge your bets, haven't you? AI might not yeah. take you off. The glasses might be 10 years away, I don't know. But you know, I'd like to be seen as a, an authoritative figure in, in that industry, if I can get there, you know, before the glasses take off. Um, because then there's going to be very few people know how to do that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So I'd be laughing, but it's just, it's stuff that I enjoy as well. Um, no, that's cool. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. That's for sure. It's it's no different to anything else, isn't it? So the people who saw like the artificial and um, machine learning sort of wave come in, they were like, yeah, let's let's go learn ML.net or um, you know machine learning languages, and it's it's the same with the cloud, isn't it? Um, a lot of people jumped on Azure very early and and, and stuff like that. You've, you've, got to, always... you've got to really, you've got to really enjoy it to tear it apart and spend the time that it takes to proper understand it, or yeah. you, else you're just going to give up on it. I, I believe. Yeah, there's always going to be early adopters, isn't there, for everything? The people at the cutting edge just want to try something because it's new. Um, what's the book? Uh, Crossing the chasm. Uh, that's it. So it's like with any adoption of technology, there's a period of uh, early adopters. Then uh, the, the, is it the visionaries and early adopters then you get the uh, mainstream people and then the laggard, laggards which I don't like that word but um, yeah so there's a, there's a curve isn't there, of, of people's approach to risk um, and, and try new things innovators, early adopters early majority, late majority laggards there you go. that's it, yeah I think so I'm going to go, although I don't think that me leaving will end the meeting, so you are more than welcome to carry on, but I will stop it recording.